Well, hello there. This is where I would usually say good morning and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. But it's not the morning. It is, in fact, the evening here in the East Coast time zone because we're doing an emergency impromptu hangouts and headlines with probably very little hanging out, a whole lot of headlines, or at least a whole lot of substance. Because as you might have followed in the channel, we've been covering Elon Musk and Twitter's escalating catfight on their very own service that had been threatening by Twitter that they would sue in the Delaware Court of Chancery. And lo and behold, very shortly after, they actually threatened that. Only a couple of days, if we're being honest. That lawsuit, 60 plus pages of it, has been filed. And I thought, hey, rather than just review it and wait for tomorrow and go through the highlights and everything else, every single person in my timeline is talking about it. Folks want to see what I have to say about it, which you know feels good, but I haven't read the thing at all, so I thought we would read through it together. And I invited all my friends, including, of course, Mark from Attractive Nuisance, who should be studying for the bar right now, but is instead hanging out with us for at least a period of time here mm -hmm. to talk through some of the issues. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Hey, great. I mean, really, this is issue spotting, right? You know, like this is this is absolutely I couldn't pass this up. And everyone was sending me the Elon Musk sniping back and forth anyway. You know, I got to I, I got to at least inform myself. This is my break. Hope. This yeah, is break, sounds good. You know? Well, and if it winds up take, running long, taking us a while, you're obviously under no obligation to stay when you got to study for that bar. But yeah, this is the this is the standard YouTube content creators, uh, you know, day because I have put up a video called Twitter Strikes Back to talk about their threats, their threatening letters to the SEC and Elon putting up his meme answers all of, I don't know, two hours ago, two and a half hours ago. And of course, it's great. I'll collect some clicks for people that think that that's a discussion of the lawsuit, but folks are going to be disappointed. <laughs> so, so we're going to try to get this video up as well uh, and put an update in that video. So we have a whole series now. So we can have Elon backs out, Twitter strikes back, and then Twitter really, really strikes back. Uh, you know, we'll see if we can figure out I mean, uh, a it, name for that. Yeah, we're re return of the Twitter, I guess, would be the, if we're going with the with the same notification of of Elon Strucks back. You know, return yep. of the Twitter. Or return whichever. of the Twitter could be revenge of the Twitter. We can oh, that's a good one. Feel about yeah. Twitter. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I don't want. Yeah, I don't want to say put them on one side or the other here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But folks, uh, you know, this is going to be a, a, a free conversation. You're used to me having things already highlighted, ready to go, thoughts on everything. You're going to get to see the process, how the sausage is made. So I apologize in advance. I think we're going to have some great conversations at me, at Hogue Law, if you want to add to that conversation. We're not going to be separating out hangouts and chats and things. If you have questions, ask them. We're doing it live so that folks can get in there and, and talk to us about what we're seeing here. And let's dive in because New yeah. York Times has a headline immediately, right? Like we're up and running live like within a half hour <laughs> of this of this news going live. New York Times had a headline ready to go, got it out faster. Um, and uh, they're already ready to go. Great for me because the conceit of these episodes is that there's a headline involved, but we're not gonna read this article at all because we aren't interested in it. That's not you, New York Times. That's me. Don't worry about it. It's not you. Instead, we've got this ready to go. In my, in my favorite highlighting program, Weva, before anybody asks, uh, which is a Chrome extension so that you can highlight PDFs on your own. I'm not going to be using any kind of concept here for the highlighting other than to point it out as we go along. Um, and let's talk about it. So we got a verified complaint. This is what Twitter has accused Elon Musk of doing. If you followed along with the videos in this space, you knew they threatened this. And you knew that we had talked about the fact that Elon Musk announcing to the world that he was terminating the agreement based on Twitter not providing the information that he had asked for. He says there's more bots than the 5% that they had announced. Twitter says, we're trying to be responsive to your needs here in the request that you're making. Elon says, you are not succeeding in that. And as I said, in both of those videos, we are not close enough. Nobody on the internet is close enough to the question to know exactly who's screwing who in that particular interaction that Elon Musk could be asking for ridiculous stuff that Twitter doesn't shouldn't have to provide. They don't have to invent data to hand over to Elon, or that he could be asking for simple stuff and Twitter really just isn't following along with what they should be doing for their good faith and fair dealing. Where you come out on that is largely going to be a reflection, a Rorschach test of how you feel about these two enterprises more yeah. than anything else. We're yeah. not a fly in that room. Um, <laughs> but, but what we do know is that if, if Twitter can meet the burden 
can say, hey, look, we're doing our best. This guy's asking for crazy stuff or whatever else might be their factual assertions, probably in this complaint that says, we are trying to fulfill that request for information. Then Elon Musk announcing to the world that this is a breach and I'm not going through with the agreement is actually Elon Musk's breach because he has an obligation to proceed with the transaction. And so this comes down to a court of law saying, no, Twitter did what it was supposed to do or Twitter didn't. And Twitter says, yes, we did what we're supposed to do. $54 is looking real nice. You get in there and get that financing, Elon Musk. And here we are with Twitter asking the Delaware Court of Chancery to force Elon Musk to get the financing, to spend the money, and to buy the shares from the Twitter stockholders. Now, as part of, say, Debt v. Heard or any other lawsuits that you might have been watching online, you probably already know the starting point for this is that courts don't love equitable answers. Courts like to ask for money to change hands. They don't really love to make people do things. There's a whole you know, slavery concept in America. We don't like it. Yet, one of the areas in which a specific court has been fairly willing to force things along is the Delaware Court of Chancery, if especially they feel that one side or another in a major merger or acquisition has unclean hands, is messing around. Delaware don't like it. And we talked about that two episodes ago in Virtual Legality. We brought up the Deco Pack decision where they said, you did this deliberately. We don't care that you don't have financing. Figure it out. You're forced to buy this company. And we lined it up with Elon Musk. And it's going to depend on the facts and circumstances of what the court determines. Right now, I expect for this complaint to say effectively, we've delivered the information. Elon Musk is a crazy person and he can't roll in here like a bull in a china shop finish off with an SEC paragraph that basically accuses us of fraud and fraud on the market, and then roll out like nobody's business. And you, Delaware court, should force him to buy the company so that we can get the hell out of here and our stockholders can get 5420, nice number, Elon, and walk out the door. Is that what you're expecting to see roughly, Mark? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like you summed it up way better than they're going to in the 62-page complaint. But yeah, I mean, for the most part, you know... From what we've seen in the public, um, it does, I, we have no reason to believe that Twitter was acting in bad faith. I'm not saying that they're right here, but like we, but but I feel like coming into this complaint, I'm gonna probably agree with or kind of side with their assertions. I don't know about the specific performance though. You know, to me, it is a big ask. And who, you know, who wants Twitter to be owned by a dude who doesn't even want to own it? You know, like it's, it's, uh, it's, I know the Delaware Court of Chancery likes to do that more than anything else, but I'm going to have to be persuaded, I think, on that. More than most. You know? I mean, there's yes. still, oh, yeah, there's, yeah, still yeah. A, there's still a reluctance there, I would say, but yeah. they're more than most that court is willing to punish bad actors, especially if they're, you know, billionaires. If, if that's where Elon Musk finds himself with the court looking over the rim of its glasses and saying, come on now, man, then he's got a real potential problem there. So I don't care whether you want it or not. Go find the $44 billion is a possibility, depending on how all this goes. Uh, yeah. Now, it's clear that Twitter doesn't want to just let him walk away. I, I think that Twitter could ask for their billion dollars and probably get it out of Elon uh, to just to just leave. Twitter doesn't want to do that. Twitter says, no, 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 we're done. $54. That's great. But, uh, but do, you, do you think he'd do it? I don't think... I think Elon has shown a propensity to do a lot of, to take a, a public stance in a contrary way and kind of do that, do that fighting thing. I don't think that he would just pay a billion dollars and go away unless he thought that paying that billion and walking away made him look cooler, you know? Yeah, it's possible. He would try to frame it however he frames yeah. it, right? I mean, like yeah, that's- Yeah, and then, yeah. The interesting part about him, right, is I have a pretty good track record prognosticating on, on mergers and acquisitions because you can see the signs and you can uh, you can analyze these things. Elon continues to be a kind of uh, chimeric uh, miasma that I, I can't ever fully decide which direction he's coming from, whether he's playing games, whether he's trolling, what he wants to do uh, on any given moment in time, which is interesting. It's novel for the channel. But I got people in the comments saying, oh, no, he was always going to do this. And then it was going to be a lawsuit and things like that. It's like more power to you. Uh, but it's not how these things ordinarily go. This has been a wild ride for the past three, four, five months. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. I mean, and, and this was you did this before, right? Like M and A, M and A was kind of your thing at one point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did, mer I did mergers and acquisitions for 
uh, well, at this point, the better part of 20 years, though, certainly going from, you know, big firm life to solo firm life, you're doing different, you're doing different sure. kinds of mergers and acquisitions. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but yeah, no, I did big complicated ones and now I do mostly exits and, and, and maybe strategic acquisitions and things like that. Yeah. But you, but you don't see a lot of CEOs or, or chairmen kind of quite like Elon. He kind of, uh, marches to the beat of his own drum sometimes. You know? Well, I, I, I don't know that I've ever seen. Like the CEO of Tesla puts some memes up about Twitter. The Twitter board chair responds. It's like, what are we doing? <laughs> oh gosh, These yeah, public companies. <laughs> uh, all right, so let, let's start reading because this is going to be. We got sixty pages here. We could skip maybe some venue stuff or whatnot. But plaintiff Twitter by and through its underside counsel, which I believe, if I counted correctly, there are ten signed lawyers to this. So Wachtell Lipton, folks just got paid yeah, uh, and they will continue to do so. If you're ever wondering who wins in these kinds of situations, the answer is Skadden Arps and Wachtell Lipton. The lawyers always win. Um, and so Elon's paying a bill and Twitter's paying a bill now. In April 22nd, uh, in April, 2022, Elon Musk entered into a binding merger agreement with Twitter. Binding important, of course, because it was in fact binding, ostensibly designed to make both sides go through with the deal promising to use his best efforts to get the deal done. Actually, it's his reasonable best efforts, which your mileage may vary on whether that changes the contract terms or not, but fair enough. Now, less than three months later, Musk refuses to honor his obligations to Twitter and its stockholders because the deal he signed no longer serves his personal interests. Putting that bad faith concept in the court's mind to start, having mounted a public spectacle to put Twitter in play, and having proposed and then signed a seller-friendly merger agreement, Musk apparently believes that he, unlike every other party subject to Delaware contract law, is free to change his mind, trash the company, disrupt its operations, destroy stockholder value, and then walk away. This repudiation follows a long list of material contractual breaches by Musk that have cast a pall over Twitter and its business. Twitter brings this action to enjoin Musk from further breaches, to compel Musk to fulfill his legal obligations, and to compel consummation of the merger upon satisfaction of the few outstanding conditions, which are existent, and we'll talk about that uh, in, in just a minute, probably a few minutes from here since we're in the first paragraph. But rhetorically, you can see it is what we expected. We're going to cast Elon Musk as the wild card actor. We're going to talk about how he has operated here like a bull in a china shop rolling in, announcing his 9% interest in Twitter, maybe violating SEC rules and doing so after he pops above 5%, then saying, well, maybe I'll take a board seat. No, I don't want a board seat at all. Well, maybe I'll buy the company. Oh, you swallowed a poison pill. Well, I'll ram it down your throat. And then, uh, I don't know, do I want Twitter? <laughs> and then finishing off with an SEC letter that says, oh, no, Twitter's a complete fraud. Uh, they're going to have an MAE, a material adverse event, because uh, the SEC is going to find out that they're frauds. And I'm putting this here in a public document I'm filing with the SEC. So sorry about that, Twitter. Good luck. And so I don't think anything that they say is wrong here. Rhetorically, it's it's a little bit more flourishy than I like. This is what lawyers do, litigators in particular. Um, but more than most, it kind of sounds like what happened, uh, at least as we can see right now. Any other thoughts, Mark? No, I think you said it with a rhetorical flourish uh, that I couldn't help but to add to. I well, certainly, I, love I will. Like this, man. <laughs> yeah, I will double down on. Yeah, I will double down on. I would not have written it this way. Um, yeah. As far as the sort of you know, but I this think, is for us. This is yeah, to, and, and I, virtual legality to read or New New York Times to cover. Or, I mean, I, I assume that they care more about what I have to say than the Times. Absolutely. But outside of that, this is for people to read because people are going to get only a few pages in. And so they want to, they want to hit you with all this stuff. Like it's, you know, a, a, a movie review and, up at the I'm top. Gonna, and I'm not going to lie. I think that Twitter's lawyers here, um, you know, it's very rare when you're in kind of a corporate environment that you get a license to, to behave like this, <laughs> like to kind of be a little more flourishy. But I think that uh, they were probably very excited that it's like, Oh, we can meme it out. You know, like we could not, they're obviously, to the untrained eye, this doesn't look like memeing it out, but but it's any, you know, if you're at Skadden, this is pretty, this is, you know, this is pretty narratively driven, I guess you would say. Yes, uh, this is Wachtell's, just so we're clear. Oh, Skadden okay, is Elon's, Wachtell is Twitter's. 
Um, they're all the yeah. same to me. All those white and shoes would, are all the same to me. <laughs> I would expect, based on the video I made today, that they're going to reference the fact that Elon Musk went with meme answers to their letter that they filed yesterday. So <laughs> Elon puts up a Chuckmate meme uh, and then a meme about forcing Twitter into court. And I, I don't know how I described it in the video uh, from this afternoon, but it was something like, well, Elon Musk responds in a very Elon Muskian fashion. Uh, and it's, it's these. But I would expect, because we do know from the letter that they filed with the SEC, that they believe he's violating effectively their no disparagement slash no announcement clause in the contract with those memes, uh, that they will come up here because it was a part of their letter. Um, so those memes happened after the letter. I would expect them in this complaint. So you you will get memes in this complaint if so, they do what I think they did. So it's going to be visual. You're gonna you you think we're gonna see you're gonna. It see might the just pictures? be the quote blocks. You know, it might be the quote blocks of like what is okay. said. I think if you're trying to communicate, Chuck mate. You got to throw up the picture of Chuck Norris. And as you say, <laughs> I think you're exactly right. If you're working at Wachtell Lipton and you're used to describing mergers in cold language and talking about you know ball bearing company X and the issues they have with the pricing of market Y and these kinds of things, you say this is Twitter versus Elon Musk. And Twitter says, have at, well, then you get this kind of stuff. It's right. Oh, my, the novel that's half finished in my desk drawer, says the senior partner. We're going to use some of that language. We're ready to go. Right? That's yeah. what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think a well, lot of people, I think a lot of people walked over excited to be able to write like this. So I'll yes. give them a little license, you know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Musk, the chief executive officer of Tesla Inc. and leader of SpaceX and other entities, opened a Twitter account in 2009. His presence on the Twitter platform is ubiquitous. It is at that. With over 100 million followers, Musk's account is one of the most followed on Twitter. And he has tweeted more than 18,000 times, which I have to admit is a smaller number than I thought for Elon Musk. He has also suggested he would consider starting his own company to compete with Twitter. Suggesting, again, just implying. We don't need to accuse anybody of anything. Could be nefarious intent, Your Honor. I don't know. You read the document as you will. <laughs> on, on April 25th, 2022, Musk, acting through and with his solely owned entities, parent and acquisition sub, agreed to buy Twitter for $54.20 per share, because he's Elon Musk, in cash for a total of about $44 billion. In fact, if you're interested in that $54.20, I did do a video on that 20 cents just to make the pot joke and what it cost him in the number of shares outstanding if he does have to go through with the deal. Pretty funny. That price presented by Musk on a take it or leave it basis in an unsolicited public offer represented a 38% premium over Twitter's unaffected share price before the offer was made. The other terms Musk offered and agreed to were, as he touted, seller friendly. So here Twitter is acknowledging that the deal is pretty pro Twitter. I, I found it to be neutral ish, but there's some good Twitter terms in there. There is no financing contingency and no diligence condition. The deal is backed by airtight debt and equity commitments. Musk has personally committed $33.5 billion. The no diligence condition is playing a little fast and loose with kind of the internet rumors here. So there is an informational covenant. There is a responsiveness covenant. Um, that's actually what we're fighting over. That's what Elon Musk and Twitter are fighting over. So there's a diligence component between signing and closing, but there isn't a formal diligence process from like a term sheet to a merger agreement stage. After the merger agreement was signed, the market fell. As the Wall Street Journal reported recently, the value of Musk's stake in Tesla, the anchor of his personal wealth, has declined by more than $100 billion from its November 2021 peak. So here they're giving motivation, right? He's not just a crazy person, Your Honor. He's lost all this money in the market. Things have gone badly for him. So Musk wants out. Rather than bear the cost of the market downturn as the merger agreement requires, Musk wants to shift it to Twitter stockholders. This is in keeping with the tactics Musk has deployed against Twitter and its stockholders since earlier this year when he started amassing an undisclosed stake in the company and continued to grow his position without the required notification, right? So again, he doesn't care about SEC rules and regulations. That stuff is evident. And so they're using these footfalls, which wouldn't ordinarily be the end of the world. They're certainly minor penalties for somebody of Elon Musk's wealth, but they're using that to establish that he's not a rule player. He's a wild card actor and the court needs to step in and do something about him. They haven't even said any part of their argument. They just said things about Elon Musk so far. It tracks the disdain he has shown for the company that one would have expected Musk as it would be steward to protect. Since signing the merger agreement, Musk has repeatedly disparaged Twitter and the deal, creating business risk for Twitter and downward pressure on its share price, which is all well and good, again, court, if he goes through with the deal. If he doesn't, that isn't good at all. 
Now, it's it's interesting. The counter that's obvious here is he owns 10% of the company or so right now. Ordinarily, if you're not a crazy person, you don't just want to depress the share price of what you just invested in. But Elon Musk, folks. <sighs> Musk's exit strategy is a model of hypocrisy. They're, they're, the flourishes are coming fast. Yeah, man. One of the chief reasons Musk cited on March 31st, 2022 for wanting to buy Twitter was to rid it of the crypto spam he viewed as a major blight on the user experience. There's a lot of crypto bots. Musk said he needed to take the company private because, according to him, purging spam would otherwise be commercially impractical. In his press release announcing the deal on April 25th, 2022, Musk raised a clarion call to defeat the spam bots. But when the market declined and the fixed price deal became less attractive, Musk shifted his narrative, suddenly demanding verification that spam was not a serious problem on Twitter's platform and claiming a burning need to conduct diligence he had expressly forsworn. Again, God, the diligence stuff, that's not what happens in the merger agreement, folks. Twitter is playing this card too strongly. Uh, I don't blame them. It's a, it's a it's a card that they can use, but he did not forswear the, the ability to look at the company at all. That's not how signing to closing works uh, in a merger document, although the internet believes it is. And so some of this, again, going back to Mark's point on drafting and whatnot, this is, this is for you and I. The early pages here are for the various journalistic outlets to report on. And here they're saying effectively, Elon Musk waived diligence. And that's, that's not... It's not really very accurate. Musk's strategy is also a model of bad faith. While pretending to exercise the narrow right he has under the merger agreement to information for consummation of the transaction, this is the information section, Musk has been working furiously, albeit fruitlessly, to try to show that the company he promised to buy and not disparage has made material misrepresentations about its business to regulators and investors. He has also asserted falsely that consummation of the merger depends on the results of his fishing expedition and his ability to secure debt financing. And technically, it does, although he's promised to use, uh, again, those best efforts to get that debt financing. And nobody really wonders whether Elon Musk could collect $44 billion if he needed to. So uh, 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 kind of a wrong point that otherwise the spirit of which is true. So uh, I'll allow it on this particular point. Um, but yes, yeah, so what they're saying is Elon Musk asks for this information, right? 6.4 of the merger agreement says, you'll turn over Twitter, the information that I ask for to get to the consummation of the transaction, which is his quasi-diligence provision between signing and closing. And the big fight here is, is Elon Musk using it to try to consummate the transaction or to try to get out of it? And is this broader than what that information section actually poses? Honestly, in a perfect world, this would be written more clearly with this is the information you get, this is how people respond to it. And it's just kind of this broad, we'll turn over the information that you require. So Elon Musk has made some seemingly substantive, very large requests of information that Twitter has either been unable or unwilling to fulfill. And that leads you to this point in time. Is he deliberately doing this in order to get out of the deal and or negotiate a lower price? I don't know. Certainly it has that kind of indicia if you're inclined to believe that is the case with Elon Musk. But... It can be. Certainly, Twitter has acted in the past. Twitter has paid penalties for getting wrong information out there about its bot system and its accounts and things uh, that it could be the case that Twitter isn't being as responsive as it should be. Uh, Mark, I think you've already given me your, your, your kind of tilt on this, that you're, you're more likely to decide that Twitter is either doing its best or doing enough to comply with the 6.4 requirements. Is that still the case as we read? Well, I mean, I think I mean, I guess what I was saying is that um, I don't believe that Twitter is a bad faith actor in the sense that I assumed that this complaint would not make me think they are a bad faith actor. Now, right. what, the, the response the response to this complaint could absolutely sway me, but I don't think that they are lodging this in bad faith, nor that they've behaved ab absurdly in bad faith yet. That That's kind of what I'm saying. I'm no... Yeah. Twitter that's lover, fair, Mark. Here, but like I, I think that's right because I think it, 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 I think at bare minimum we're in the large gray area, right? I said that we couldn't tell from outside. We really can't because yeah. there's a way that this looks where Elon is asking for reasonable things and Twitter is holding it back, and and a really bad scenario, a bad universe in which Twitter's holding it back because they know it shows bad things, right? And there's the alternative where Twitter is trying its best with its data analysts trying to put together things in sheets and then Elon's changing it all over the place, right? We do see in even Elon's letter that he says he changed the request to uh, simplify it for Twitter like three times in the last month. And it's like, well, reasonable minds can differ as to whether you simplified the requirements or you made them do a different table. 
right? I mean, like there's right, it, right. It depends. Well, so, and, the, and yeah. the big thing is when you're if you're going to let's assume right that Twitter has this information that they don't want to get out. That that is the worst case scenario, right? The the the, the baddest of fakes. That Twitter is like, oh no, this is a big problem for us. So they're initiating this to try and not let any of that get out. And oh no, Elon found it. Would you enter into an agreement with a notoriously public figure, public and erratic figure in the space who would find out this information that would be damaging to the company that would make it less likely for Elon to want it? You know, like it just, if they did that, that is egregiously a terrible business strategy to do. I'm not saying they wouldn't do it. Twitter has made some terrible business strategy decisions in the last couple of years. But like, to my mind, I would need to see some evidence to believe that that were the case because um, they're not just acting with a regular, a regular actor here. They're acting with someone who, who is, and famous on the platform. Twitter knows yep. of this guy. He's Twitter famous, you know? So I don't know, uh, you know, may, I'm, everybody's going to think I'm some sort of like corporate social media sellout here, but like nothing, but nothing yeah, I've Mark. seen so far has made me believe this erratic one guy screaming from the rooftop over what I have seen is fairly generic corporate behavior here, you know, but. Um, I'm well, and they could have been sandbagging a little bit. There's kind of a margin for, you know, right. not being the world's best data provider in these things. So there's, it, it's it's hard to tell again without those facts. And I agree with you when you say, I don't think I'll think worse of Twitter after this complaint. Wachtel really didn't earn its money if you wind up thinking worse of Twitter after their complaint document. So you, I, I agree with you completely. You've certainly read complaints that you're like, oh shit, you've got nothing here, got right? Nothing. I mean, like, it, this is, by the way, I don't know if you noticed in that last paragraph that their M dashes looked different. Oh, Okay, it was something on the screen. Never mind. I was going to <laughs> bash Wachtel for not harmonizing. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sure they have all their formatting correct. My <laughs> formatting is undoubtedly worse. Um, but uh, yeah. All right. So we're in July here. On July 8th, 2022, a little over a month after first using bad faith pursuit of spam related evidence to assert a baseless claim of breach. Okay, so they just accused him of bad faith at the top. Musk gave Twitter notice purporting to terminate the merger agreement. It's not that many days ago, folks. The notice alleges three grounds for termination. One, purported breach of information sharing and cooperation covenants. Two, supposedly materially inaccurate representations in the merger agreement that allegedly are reasonably likely to result in a company material adverse effect. That's the, in particular, the representation that talks about the fact that their SEC filings are accurate. And purported failure to comply with the ordinary course covenant by terminating certain employees, slowing hiring, and failing to retain key personnel. I actually like that one in some ways the best because Twitter has been doing some stuff with their with their staffing. And ordinarily, you don't do that between signing and closing. Yeah. Ten, these claims are pretexts and lack any merit. So this right here, this is lawyer for that person's a dirty liar, your honor. A dirty, dirty liar. Do something to stop him. Twitter has abided by its covenants and no company material adverse effect has occurred or is reasonably likely to occur. We're good boys. Musk, by contrast, has been acting against this deal since the market started turning and has breached the merger agreement repeatedly in the process. He has purported to put the deal on hold pending satisfaction of imaginary conditions, breached his financing efforts obligations in the process. We don't know much about that one. Violated his obligations to treat requests for consent reasonably and to provide information about financing status, violated his non-disparagement obligation, misused confidential information, and otherwise failed to employ required efforts to consummate the acquisition. So we know bits and pieces of this, right? So I did a video on when he announces to the world he's put the deal on hold, and I think I called it, uh, that's not a thing. You can't, <laughs> what? What? You're signed up. You're, you're, you're proceeding. What are we talking about here? The rest of this makes sense for an actor who is slowballing things. Right. So when he says he puts it on hold, then he stops. Presumably the accusation here is he stops calling the banks and telling them what's happening and getting together his financing, which he's the big part of. But he still has financing partners violated his obligations to treat requests for consent reasonably. So that's third parties. Uh, right. So when you have a deal like this, you have a change in control. There are third parties that either have a contractual or other relationship with the deal or with the companies or regulators, government entities, and they're going to ask for certain things. 
you're going to say, hey, you need to consent to this deal in order for it to go through. And they're going to say, great. Elon, talk to us about where the money's coming from. How does this work? Or whatever else they might ask for. It really depends on the relationship they have. And so this accusation is these people were asking for reasonable stuff. And Elon's like, nah, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to turn over that. I'm not going to work with those people. You figure it out, Twitter. Uh, and then, uh, you know, tell me where to sign and maybe I'll do something. Maybe I won't. This is kind of in the bag of tricks for a buyer's remorse kind of buyer. Uh, that they aren't really interested in proceeding with the transaction. They're going to try to do the bare minimum to not result in this. They don't want this. This document is bad. Things have gone wrong. Um, but they're going to try to get it until you're either so pissed at them that you don't want to proceed or otherwise just kind of drag things along. Uh, and that's what the accusation is. This matches up with behavior traits that I have seen in deals that have gone sour from the buyer side. Of course, as I say in the space, don't confuse me for somebody that has a B Next to the purchase price uh, in the companies that I represent, that's a very different tier of law firm uh, for me. But I have done hundreds of millions, so that counts, right? So uh, you're saying that if you're a company looking for representation and maybe you don't need to have made a billion dollars, you could call the Hogue Law Firm? Is that what you're saying? Right. I do exits all the time. Absolutely. I wow, do. Okay, I, I have fun okay. with them. Mostly, I do things like sell family bakeries now and have a lot, much better time than doing ultra complicated multi-finance transactions across borders. But either way... Yes, I don't have the bees next to my name, but at a certain level, these things are the same, uh, regardless of the purchase price. So we look at this and it matches up. I've had a deal that that really tried to die, uh, didn't wind up here in court, but the buyer was clearly doing things like just going dark. Uh, you get a request and you tell, and that buyer tells the lawyers, I've been on this side, honestly, uh, don't talk to them for at least five days. Like just don't respond. It's like, oh, always and made you me feel icky. I'm yep. a responder. I get the email. I want to. I want to take care of it. Um, that happens with me on the, uh, you know, on the entertainment side too. It's the same thing. You know, like a deal is signed, and you're like totally pumped to do this movie, and like, then all of a sudden, side just goes dark. Or maybe go dark. you're the one. Or maybe you're the one going dark, and you're getting orders from the head to to, to go dark. Yep. Well, That's it the happens, thing I man. Tell people, we we are. <laughs> We are the representatives of other people making decisions. And that, yeah. and one of the tougher parts of this job is then not in trial. I'm a, I'm a transactional guy like you, Mark, but in even the negotiation context, knowing what your client wants done, they've made a decision. Maybe you adamantly disagree with the strategy they have chosen to pursue. Maybe you even think it's a bit asshole -ish or whatever it is that they're going and then trying to put the best kind of gloss on that and proceed with that representation. That's the hardest part of the job to me is you're not the final arbiter of what the strategy is. And have, have my favorite time when this comes up, which only comes up in contractual, it doesn't happen in trial or at least as much, um, where you'll, you're set to have drinks or dinner with someone. Because, you know, you guys aren't adversarial parties. You're just two sides of a contract. You're negotiating. It's fine. You're buddies. And you're, like, going to go out for drinks or dinner. And then all of a sudden that, like, you know, that that dictate comes from on high being like, hey, don't respond to this person. Yep. And you're like, what? I, I got dinner with them tomorrow. Wait, what am I supposed to tell We're going them? to am a ball game. Yeah. Am I supposed to pretend that I'm like, oh, God, that's the worst. Yeah, no, it is the worst. It, <laughs> and it, if you already have one of those on the books when you're in a go dark, it's, it is the worst. Yeah. I have done that before where we were at a, um, I can't remember, like an awards dinner uh, or something like that. And you're going to be like at their table. And you're like, uh, so, and then you don't want to talk shop at these kinds of things, but occasionally it's like, so, you know, where's my turn? Uh, where's the turn of the docs? It's like, ah, you know, it's still in process. <laughs> wow. That was good. It sounds like you've said this before. Right? Oh God. <laughs> oh God. You know, uh, we're going to, I'm going to look right in on that. I gave it to an associate's problem. Uh, uh, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let me just finish off this intro paragraph here. Twitter is entitled to specific performance of defendant's obligation. Specific performance, of course, being you should force them to finish the deal under the merger agreement and to secure for Twitter stockholders the benefit of Musk's bargain. It's very economic language. Musk and his entities should be enjoined from further breaches. They're not just asking Elon Musk to finish the deal, but by the way, stop all this nonsense, Court. He's out there making Twitter memes and everything else. Shut him up. Ordered to comply with their obligations to work towards satisfying the few closing conditions. Uh, enjoined essentially to make them do what they're supposed to do and ordered to close upon satisfaction of those conditions. Make them buy the company. So that is the request. Um, and this is just the introductory paragraph. So we're, we'll have some things to skip. Don't get too put off by five of 62 folks. We'll, we'll find places to skim this a little bit more. Uh, but how, how do you all feel uh, about this introduction? Chat, what, if any, 
<laughs> questions do you have oh. uh, ab about what's going on here uh, that hopefully we can answer before we dig into what is going to be arguments that are all premised around sentences in those paragraphs? Um, they're not going to advance too far from make him do it. He's a bad person. Um, and here's how he's breaching the agreement. Um, or as Jason says, that's a long way of saying shit going to be lit. It's true. It's a big <laughs> fight coming. Big fight coming. Elon tweeted. Elon tweeted. I just, I, I just found it. it. It's it's a tweet. It's newsworthy. But it's not, you know, it's not. You want to share that with me, Mark? Do you know how to hit the share buttons on this thing? I sure don't. But it says, oh, the irony, lol. Oh, well, you know what? You no. can read it out. Yeah. Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if I can yeah. pull that into this. Uh, I, this can, uh, here. I can't. I think I can do it. Did I bring it up? I did. You did. Look at that. Technological pro uh, prowess here at the Hoglaw YouTube channel. Get excited, folks. Yes. Elon Musk, oh, the irony, lol. Now, I'm not positive what the irony is here. I guess he's saying that they're the bad actors. Yeah. And the yeah. lawsuit is accusing him of being a bad actor. And that is ironic. Granted, hmm, we're, on page, yet. we're on page five of 64. So potentially there's other irony that we haven't seen yet. Okay. But, you're but right. I would, but I would imagine that that is the, Oh, you're calling me the bad faith actor and the liar. Like, the fundamental thesis is look at these guys calling yeah. me out. Right. Yeah. See, yeah. Laura says, I never thought he was going to buy in the first place. Elon should hire me as his lawyer. I would never let this deal go through in the first place. <laughs> See, here's the problem. Uh, Scadden, I've talked about in the documentation we've looked at, Scadden doesn't seem entirely comfortable with some of the arguments that they are being asked to make throughout all of this. They have got a client that is doing what that client wants, and he's paying a lot of money for the privilege. So Scadden is not upset about that or, or anything. But you can tell from some of the drafting, they're trying to sneak allegedly's in there. They're trying to back <laughs> down on some of the things that the letter is otherwise clearly being dictated to say. Um, that they're sending out to the SEC. Scadden knows what it's doing. I think it might be the biggest merger and acquisition firm uh, in the country. Yeah, uh, it, uh, it, yeah. it it varies, those those top ends, depending on who's got the big deals that year. Uh, but Scadden, big, big law firm, interviewed with them. They had cots, didn't much care for it. Uh, that's that. <laughs> the cots are always a bad signal to me. Uh, so I said, thank you very, very much. Uh, moving on. Uh, let's see. The irony might be, oh, so now they want me to buy it. Um which, oh, admittedly, that's funny. it's a tumultuous relationship. I, I haven't actually seen a company immediately swallow a poison pill like Twitter did. Um, so that was that was super <laughs> bad. Um, and uh, yeah, so Twitter Twitter threw up the walls really, really fast and then got told by their lawyers, hey, actually, you got fiduciary obligations to your shareholders and this price is super nice and it's all cash. Uh, and then they backed down. And now they're, they're, they're probably in the back offices saying, see, lawyers, we told you this guy was nuts. This is this is what he's doing to this company, uh, and we should have been able to craft some kind of argument that said we don't trust you, uh, but that's not what happened, and we find ourselves in court now. Uh, we've got a bunch of Elon as Parent of the Year references in the chat, which I won't highlight, but yes, he seems very productive as as a human being on Earth. Um, so I get that, uh, but let's uh, let's proceed with the document then, folks. Again, at me if you got questions. Super chats are nice too, but not required. Uh, the parties, we don't usually have to read this section too much. We got Twitter, which is a Delaware Corp. We've talked about the accident in history that makes almost all these companies Delaware Corps. Uh, they operate in San Francisco, California. Elon owns 9.6% of Twitter stock. And folks, you know who Elon Musk is. Uh, Defendant X Holdings 1 uh, is the first subsidiary. Holdings 2 is the second subsidiary. And these are being used effectively to make the tax benefits as beneficial as possible if this merger were to go through. They're moving certain things around to the different entities. It is neither here nor there for us. For our purposes, it's about Elon Musk buying Twitter. We don't yep. much care about the tax structuring uh, on and this end. The only yeah. thing that they're trying to do here, if, if in case you're interested in this legal stuff, is using the phrase that he's a sophisticated entrepreneur that does have legal significance. Oh, sure. Um, which, I mean, you know, obviously it is standard in these sort of contracts, but... Um, sophisticated business people have different expectations met upon them um, uh, when they're doing deals like this. And so the fact that Elon is a sophisticated entrepreneur does actually have some sort of legal significance. Yep. Um, it's so. a great point. If you see the word sophisticated, that is the code word for they should not get the benefit of the doubt on things that you might otherwise give to somebody, you know, reading a big old merger agreement for the first time. Elon's been down the block and you don't get the benefit of the doubt on that kind of stuff. Uh, jurisdiction. There's no problem with jurisdiction here. 
We got Delaware companies doing Delaware things. Delaware law is entirely fine for all of this. Uh, factual allegations. So we're going to go back into the introduction here. We'll see if we can skip some of the details that we know, but we're mostly going to read this like a novel, like they present it to us. Musk sets his sights on Twitter. Musk is active on Twitter's platform and has expressed a keen interest in the use and inherent potential of the platform. By the way, our product is awesome. Starting in January 2022, Musk began purchasing Twitter stock. By March 14, 2022, he had secretly accumulated a substantial position, about 5% of the company's outstanding shares. Now, we should point out, SEC regulations required that he disclose that position no later than March 24, 2022, but he didn't do that. Musk failed to disclose and instead kept amassing Twitter stock with the market None the wiser. By April 1st, 2022, Musk had accumulated about 9.1% of the company's outstanding shares, still in secret. Not until April 4th, 2022, did Musk finally disclose his holdings, which made him Twitter's largest stockholder. He's also getting sued for this notice period right yeah. here in the week between from some stockholders that said, I think, I think their argument, if I'm recalling correctly, was we wouldn't have sold if you knew if we knew you were getting in. Um, and so he's being he's being sued for essentially his own fraud on the market. Uh, for not announcing when he is supposed to. Um, between March 24th and April 4th, over 112 million Twitter shares traded in ignorance of Musk's mounting. <laughs> I love it. It's so good, man. You're Meanwhile, telling the story. <laughs> it is. We're, we're fully in the nonfiction section of your local Barnes & Noble right now. This is, <laughs> this is going to be a book. Meanwhile, on March 26, 2022, Musk spoke with two Twitter directors, Jack Dorsey and Egon Durbin, about the future of social media and the prospect of Musk's joining the Twitter board. Soon after, Musk told Twitter CEO Parag Agrawal and Twitter board chair Brett Taylor, who's the one in the news right now, that he had in mind three options relative to Twitter. Join its board, take the company private, or start a competitor. You got to love that conversation. I own nine point whatever percent of you, and one of my options right now is to take you down. I, he, he's an interesting cat. He is an interesting cat. <sighs> Musk would repeat this statement over the coming days. His contemplation of building a rival platform to Twitter was not a secret. On March 26, 2022, he had tweeted that he was giving serious thought to the idea. That's right. And this is, again, in ignorance of the fact that he just purchased 9.1% of the company is when this tweet comes out. So there's some interesting timing just for even the, the PR aspect of all this. In early April, after further discussion among Musk, Agrawal, Taylor, and Twitter director Martha Lane Fox, chair of Twitter's nominating and corporate governance committee, the Twitter board evaluated Musk's candidacy as a director. Having considered, among other things, Musk's interest in the platform, his technical expertise, and the perspectives he could bring, the board offered Musk the position on April 3rd. It had nothing to do with cutting off his ability to purchase the company. Musk accepted. The party signed a letter agreement, and the agreement was announced on April 5th. Yeah, all of this is in the playlist, folks. If you're at all interested in the building history of this, we can do our own fun documentary at this point. We got hours and hours and hours of this stuff. There's a full video on whether or not he'll be offered a board position, whether he'll take it when it's offered, because he then was would have been asked to sign a essentially a non-compete with Twitter, that he won't buy up the company. And for a tail period, I believe, after his board of directorship. And that's when I said, hmm, I don't know that he will, I don't know that he'll agree to that. Not a week later, Musk abruptly changed tack. On April 9th, the day his appointment to the board was to become effective, Musk told Twitter he would not join the board. Instead, he would offer to buy the company. Now, I'll say this. It's obviously presented in the light that is designed to make Musk look bad, that he's at bare minimum mercurial and doing whatever he does on a whim. None of this actually strikes me as inaccurate to what we watched happen. Um, yeah. So uh, Twitter's staying pretty much above board right now in terms of the description. And part of the thing is, like, just the dates, looking at the dates, it, it is mercurial. I mean, like, <laughs> anyway. What am I going to do? I don't even know. What am I going to say when I wake up? Uh, Sky is a neighborhood with the super chat. Thank you so much, Sky. I really appreciate it. Hogue, the dramatic reading. I can't deal. Crying, laughing emoji. Rolling on the floor, laughing emoji. Hey, you know what? When you're reading this documentation, when they're going to use this verbiage, Sometimes you need to put the corporate hat on and read it with your old corporate voice that I certainly have. Co-counsel with the water knows this is going to be a long one already, folks. Thank you, honey. <laughs> and I let me know if it. you need a let me know if you need a breather at any time. Oh, can, sure. You I know can, what? I'll give I you a section. Yeah, let me go through the offer to buy. I'll give you section three. On April 13th, four days after reversing course on the board seat, 
Musk texted Taylor that he planned to make an offer to acquire all of Twitter. Now, I love this particular aspect because this is accurate, as best we can tell from the SEC filings. The SEC filing actually says message via text. And I'm like, um, you're living in your own world. You just agreed to buy a $44 billion company and the message was delivered via text. Uh. So I, I, you know what? Um, I, he's mercurial. I don't know what to think about him one way or the other, but he certainly marches to the beat of his own drummer. Uh, his unsolicited offer conveyed by letter later that day was accompanied by a threat. I'm offering to buy 100% of Twitter for $54.20 per share in cash, a 54% premium over the day before I began investing in Twitter, and a 38% premium over the day before my investment was publicly announced. My offer is my best and final offer, and if it is not accepted, I would need to reconsider my position as a shareholder. And we talked in, in this space, in virtual legality, about whether or not that's a threat. Yes, of course, it's a threat. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Well, what were you discussing about it? Like, well, what because discuss? people, okay, so folks, folks are fans of Elon Musk. Um, and, you know, it's not, I'm going to gun down your family, uh, but it is, hey, look, I own these shares. And by the way, I'm a very public individual. And if I pop my nose in and we consider board seats, we have meetings that everybody knows about. And then I walk away from those meetings and say, you know what? This company's bad <laughs> and sell all my shares. The market is going to notice that. Um, yeah. So it is an absolute threat to what is a pretty new management team, right? Dorsey's only out a year, yeah. something along those lines. Uh, and so Elon Musk is clearly throwing his weight around a little bit when he's doing all this stuff. And one could argue from a personality basis, he views them as kind of weak willed as this happens and that they can be bullied on some of this stuff. I mean, that's that's what I'm seeing well here. I mean, it worked. I mean, it worked like I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not I'm not suggesting that, like, you know, they should sue him for duress under this contract, you no. know, <laughs> whatever. but like, uh, but yeah, I mean, they agreed to the term. So, <laughs> no, I, you, know, you know, benefit of the doubt, you don't have to like it as a personality trait. He, he is clearly good at knowing where the social pressures are going to come from, where the economic pressures are going to come from, what he can do legally, mostly uh, he walks across a couple of lines. And then using that, I mean, he flat out uses their fiduciary responsibility to to crush that poison pill almost immediately. Um, yeah. And he's doing it this way. So this sounds silly to me. This is not the way I've seen offers for companies made, um, but um, it, it gets the job done because you can imagine the absolutely frightened board calls either on Zoom or in person that are happening as this goes down because uh, Elon Musk, the shark has now descended upon them. And what are they going to do? And the answer is they, they do a poison pill. I don't know if they'll mention it here because it's not their greatest look. Uh, but let's see. The following day on April 14th, Musk announced his offer publicly and noted that it was conditioned on customary business due diligence and financing. At a public event the same day, Musk, whose enormous personal wealth exceeds the capital of most public companies, non sequitur, neither here nor there, your honor, but still, don't we hate those billionaires? I think you might. Both the time they've used M dashes so far, they've been like nice little aside. These, you know? <laughs> these are these are the stage whispers. Ain't yeah. that guy? A, ain't that guy a hoot? Uh, boasted that he could technically afford to purchase Twitter outright. Also on April 14th, the Twitter board met to discuss Musk's proposal. It established a transactions committee composed of independent directors Taylor, Lane Fox, and Patrick Pichette to evaluate the proposal, oversee negotiations, and explore strategic alternatives. They're doing the normal corporate thing. They are acting in normal corporate parlance here. Put a committee together, make sure we're doing financially what we're supposed to be doing. The board was assisted in its review by Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan as financial advisors and Simpson Thatcher as independent counsel. They're, they're doing the right thing. Faced with Musk's rapid accumulation of Twitter stock and take it or leave it offer and concerned that he might launch a, a hostile tender offer without notice. That's right. We've got videos in this space explaining how a hostile tender bid works because that certainly looked like what he was threatening. The board adopted a customary shareholder rights plan to protect its stockholders. They, they do reference the poison pill from coercive or otherwise unfair takeover tactics. And you can check out that video in this space. But I will tell folks, there is nothing that looks like coercive or unfair tactics with respect to an all cash non-finance deal. Now, there's financing on the edges of this particular deal. But coercive is two-tier. Coercive is informational sharing. The, the history of poison pill plans were designed against certain things that don't have anything that matches this particular deal. So this was Twitter, in my opinion, of course, responding very panically to what was a potential good deal that they didn't want to take, at least in the instant case. And then I think they backed down from it. 
Mark, did you have any other feelings when they adopt that poison pill earlier no, this year? No, I actually mostly agree with you. You know, but I think, but I think poison pill sort of stuff. I I think that that's when I see that it's usually a response to when all of a sudden someone is accumulating a lot of their stock and they didn't know it. You know, yeah. so I didn't necessarily think about this as a response to the all cash offer as much as I thought of it as them responding panically to oh we haven't been watching enough of our stock lately. Um, but like same thing. I think it's match. I think you're. I think you're about right. Um, but you know, I, and I'm not surprised that they put it in. Um, I do think that one of the things that uh, the first thing you're taught when you're writing these things is, you know, you want to minimize bad facts and maximize good facts, right? Or omit those bad facts. The problem is if you omit really obvious bad facts, <laughs> then it looks like you're trying to hide something. So and that's coming often, back in the response. Yeah, so often it's better to to actually acknowledge it and then try and minimize it and explain it away as much you just like really quickly and then go on to something else. Um, I think that this is the right tack for them to bring it up, I think at least. But. No, I think that's, an, that's entirely fair because, yeah, the alternate universe version of this is that there's a paragraph in the response that says they, of course, neglected to inform the court that they took draconian and coercive acts of their own to prevent their shareholders from realizing the value that our client, Mr. Musk, could have given to them had they not been breaching the contracts of their own people as they breached the one with us, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, so I, I do think, I, I agree that poison pills are kind of a reflexive knee jerk. I, after the offer, I, I just don't love any aspect of this happening. Yeah, uh, that's true. Twitter. No, that's a, good, that's a good point. They should have, uh, yeah, yeah. It, there it, wasn't it, much time between the announcement of how much stock he owned and then the offer. Well, they got like, snowed. Yeah. Well, they, they got snowed, right? Because there's a meeting yeah. where they offer him a board seat in between. Yeah. And that cuts the time in between Elon evaluating whether he's going to put a bid in, I think. Right. And you could even you could even accuse him of stalling to give him enough time to put together a fair package if you wanted to. Um, that, we, that would have to be on pure speculation because I don't think that they would know uh, at this level of the complaint. Uh, but either way, poison pill put into place. The board yeah. took this action to reduce the likelihood of a takeover without payment of an appropriate control premium, which they already knew was offered at 38, which is mm, it's a, maybe a touch low, but it's market. And to ensure that the board had sufficient time to make an informed judgment on Musk's or any other offer. Under the rights plans terms, a single investor or group acquisition of more than 15% of the company's outstanding common stock without board approval gives other stockholders the opportunity to acquire additional stock at a considerable discount. The plan was adopted and announced on April 15, 2022. Now we did the analysis of that deal. The poison pill is crazy. Like it's not double, it's not triple dilution. I can't remember what it is. It's like 16 or, oh, or something really? like that. It explodes the freaking cap table. Um, okay. So, I mean, it's it's a freaking nuclear bomb of a poison pill. Plant. Yeah, they're freaking out. Yeah. But they're, I can't remember the math exactly. So don't hold me to that, folks. Past Rick has that information in the video earlier in the playlist. The board's concerns proved well-grounded. Musk began making all too obvious public references to a hostile tender offer. This is how he operates. Love me tender, he puts out on a tweet. Blank is the night, says Elon Musk. Uh, you are, you're dealing with a wild card. At the same time, Musk worked to strengthen the offer he had made and might make by tender. By April 20th, he had personally committed $21 billion in equity financing and lined up $25.5 billion of committed debt financing with $12.5 billion of that secured by his Tesla stock. He has the money for the offer that he has otherwise texted to us. Having obtained these commitments, Musk announced in an April 21st, 2022 securities filing that his offer was no longer conditioned on financing or subject to due diligence. Quote, at the time of delivery, the proposal was also subject to the completion of financing and business due diligence, but it is no longer subject to financing as a result of the reporting person's receipt of his financing commitments and is no longer subject to business due diligence. Now, this is, this is where this comes from, that he has waived diligence rights. And that's not the way diligence works, right? And Twitter's going to try to put this in here, for, as best I can tell, from building this case this way, as to say that this concept of diligence on its own is completely waived when he puts this forth in the SEC letter. What this says to me, as someone that has done mergers and acquisitions before, is that the ordinary course of business is you talk with the people, you do a term sheet, there's an interregnum period as the lawyers kind of work up definitive documents, you do the diligence at the same time, and then you are roughly happy with your diligence when you sign. You've gone through a timing process and you've had your representatives look at various things. Elon Musk accelerated that. So that period didn't exist, as best I can tell. And then 
in both circumstances, whether you've done a normal business due diligence period or not, you still have conditions to closing. You still sign the merger agreement and then have things pop in. And what Twitter is trying to argue here, and I don't know whether it will work in the court of chancery. I think it's not the greatest argument, but I'd rather be Twitter than Elon Musk on this point. They're trying to say that section 6.4, where they have to give information that he requests to consummate the transaction, is effectively a kind of scrivener's uh, provision that is the same as them asking for information for her to consent to third parties. Uh, that he's allowed to ask for things that help effectuate it, that he might need, the bank might need our EIN number, whatever it might be, but he's not supposed to do these diligence tasks. I don't read it that way. And there are ways to write it the way that Twitter is arguing for. I don't think 6.4 says that. And I might drag it up in this uh, as we as we go here because I have it uh, ready from some of the other videos I've done. But we can talk about what it says when we get to discussing 6.4 directly. Uh, Musk proclaimed himself prepared to begin negotiations immediately and confirmed he was exploring whether to commence a tender offer. He is using rhetoric to bully them. And I say that not as a negative connotation. This is what somebody that wants to make something happen does. You don't have to like it. You don't have to like Elon Musk as a person, but he's he's using every rhetorical device at his uh, beck and call to push them into making this decision. On Saturday, April 23rd, 2022, Musk asked to speak with Twitter representatives about his offer. At the direction of the Transactions Committee, Taylor engaged with Musk, who reiterated that his offer was best and final and threatened once again to take it to Twitter stockholders directly if the board did not engage immediately. That's a tender offer. That, that's a description of a tender. Instead of asking the company to facilitate the sale, you just ask everybody that held stock, which is the really short form way of describing a tender offer. Of course, because it's American law, we've got lots of logistics and things that go along with that whole process, but essentially it's going and asking for the people to sell directly rather than the company. The following day on Sunday, April 24th, 2022, Musk tried again to force Twitter's hand. He delivered a letter to the board repeating that his $54.20 per share offer was best and final, threatening once more to sell all of his shares if his bid were rejected and saying he would propose a seller-friendly merger agreement to be signed before the market opened the next day. Musk's counsel sent over a draft agreement. Respect, Skadden. You're ready for this. Reiterated that Musk's <laughs> offer was not contingent on any due diligence and underscored that the form of the proposed agreement was intended to make this easy on all to get to a deal ASAP. I love this, by the way. This is this is the equivalent of, again, and I'm not speaking ill of Elon Musk. I don't know him from Adam. I'm just talking about the way this looks. Feels like that Twilight Zone episode where the devil shows up with a contract and just says, it's easy as pie. Here's here's the quill. You just, you just look at it. You just sign it. We've drafted it up. You can trust Skadden. Skadden's got you all taken care of. Just <laughs> sign right here, and we're going to get this deal done. Right? We, it's intended to make this easy on all to get to a deal ASAP. You don't even yeah. need to turn it. You don't Remember, even turn I, this document. I got the pen, man. And don't worry. If you don't, I got a pen. I can, we can sign it in blood. It's cool. No it's, bigs. We, any fluid will work. It's called wet ink, but it doesn't have to be ink. Don't you worry about it, friends. The agreement was negotiated through the night, again, respect lawyers, <laughs> Yep. and in the process became even more seller friendly. Elon Musk, as described by Twitter right now, is essentially giving on their asks, right? In a negotiation, either side asks for something, and generally speaking, one side is going to give and one side is going to get, maybe with some splits there, here and there, but leverage is going to depend on it. And here, Twitter is describing a situation in which they felt they had leverage, that Elon Musk has this deal in front of them and is saying, no, no, absolutely. You need that? Fine. You need that? Fine. Among the provisions not contained in Musk's proposal, but included at Twitter's insistence, now we're getting interesting, were an undertaking by defendants, including Musk, to take or cause to be taken all actions and to do or cause to be done all things necessary, proper, or advisable to obtain the financing to consummate the transaction, that's 610, a clear disclaimer of any financing condition to closing, that's 610F, and a right on Twitter's part to request and promptly receive updates from Musk about his progress in obtaining financing. That's 610D. Now, 610 is not a section that they reference too strongly in other aspects of this. They did put it in their letter that they sent to the SEC yesterday, so we'll see where this goes. But they're highlighting this because they think this is a kill shot uh, for Elon Musk not proceeding with the financing, either not having it or killing it separately from all this, or not doing all that he can to get the financing through the door, which, of course, they accuse him of in the introduction. Um, so they say they negotiated for this because it was important to them. And Elon Musk is deliberately breaching this. This is a breach fight. Remember, Elon says they breached. Twitter is responding by he breached. 
Um, and that's what they're going to discuss in these various paragraphs. These provisions ensured that financing would be no obstacle to closing and that the company would have the right to stay informed of Musk's progress in arranging his financing. Twitter also negotiated for itself a right to hire and fire employees at all levels, including executives, without having to seek Musk's consent. True. Musk's initial draft of the merger agreement would have deemed the hiring and firing of an employee at the level of vice president or above a presumptive violation of the ordinary course covenant absent Musk's consent. Twitter successfully struck that provision before signing. That's not the issue that Elon Musk raised, which I have to admit I'm fairly sympathetic to, which is when Twitter announces that it's cut off whatever it was, like, uh, it, it laid off a third of, of its staff on uh, l- last week, I believe, uh, that that's that's not ordinary course in general. No. Um, and so one of the things I almost tweeted out, which I had now just so I could show it and say, ha ha, uh, was that you would ordinarily presume that Elon Musk has signed off on that um, because Twitter wouldn't otherwise do it without the sign off of the buyer. Uh, but that's it's clear that that didn't happen. And now Twitter's argument would appear to be that still ordinary course ish slash allowed under the merger agreement. So we'll see where they go with that. Twitter further negotiated to narrow the circumstances under which defendants could escape the deal by claiming a company material adverse effect. In addition to excluding, for example, market-wide and industry-wide effects and circumstances and declines in stock price and financial performance, which are totally normal market exclusions, the final definition excluded matters relating to or resulting from Musk's identity or communications, performance of the agreement, and any matter disclosed by Twitter in its SEC filings other than the risk factors and forward-looking statement sections of those disclosures. And yeah, they talk about the SEC statements there and they did negotiate for, you can't get out of the deal if the stock price plummets because you're Elon Musk, which I thought was interesting. You don't see that provision in all the MAE uh, clauses. And I can bring those up, Mark, if you're at all interested. In no, them. oh no, it's just, those are, you know, those are pretty good things to have gotten in there. It's like good on them, you know, or whatever, if they're bringing this. Um... Yeah, well, here's your, here's your, here's your MAE clause. It's, uh, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's the whole thing. Um, uh, but yeah, you can see excluded is any matter disclosed in the company SEC documents filed by the company prior to the date of the agreement, other than disclosure set under the headings, risk factors, or forward-looking statements. Now, the counter argument to this, right? Remembering that Elon Musk is saying that the company might just experience a company material adverse effect, which would kick him out of his obligations under the agreement. We can go through all the provisions, but we're going to skip that for right now. It would kick him out because they couldn't otherwise comply with their various covenants and things like that. If there's an MAE, he can get out of the deal. He's not saying that the SEC filings themselves are, are, are an issue. And this is designed to exclude when we disclose problems. What Elon Musk is saying is that they disclosed 5% of bots, give or take. I think they have a kind of about language in their SEC filings. And I believe he said it is wildly undercounted. Now, do I recommend that as a lawyer, putting that out in a public document? I don't, Um, (laughs) but but he did. Um, And so this wouldn't actually get you out of an MAE. Let's say that that were true, that they say 5% in their disclosures and it's actually 25%. Um, this provision, I don't read to be covering that. I think Twitter is going to argue that it does. Like that's the only reason you would bring it up in the complaint at this point in time. We'll see what they say. Finally, they're just setting up the background. Uh, but this provision doesn't say, Hey, if you're wildly wrong in your sec disclosures, it can't be a company material adverse effect because what Elon has argued is that it ain't, it ain't the filing. That's the problem. It's when the sec comes down on your asses. That's the problem. Um, and this particular language is supposed to say, hey, if we disclosed it, if we disclosed that we have an environmental claim uh, on one of our offices or that XYZ happened, that gets you out of a material adverse effect because it's otherwise publicly known and the market should have already priced it in, right? Like that's what all this language is designed to do. The fact that we say it's 5% and it's actually 25%, that's not priced in. Um, and so I would say that that's outside of what they're they're looking at here. Which I agree if if it was 8%. Do you? Th- I mean, do you think that that would be contained? Like, I, I, I think that clause does include that. I think that clause would be if it's eight percent. Well, they so they disclose that they've got bots, right? And they yeah, disclose sure. they have about five percent of bots. They think, right? Uh, and it's not, it's not super strong. It's not like a guarantee of five percent. Um, but yeah, I think you get into an argument about what material difference is, right? I mean, like that's you'd start to argue about was that actually disclosed? Let's say you know if it were fifty percent, that's not disclosed. If half yeah. the users on Twitter are bots, first of all, I believe it. Second of all, that's not been disclosed in the financial statements. I'm arguing uh, with some of them right now, actually. Yeah, see, you got to look out for that. <laughs> you got to look out for that. So, yeah, I, I think that um, yet you're exactly right. If it's 5.3%, get out of here, Elon. If it's 8 you know, we're getting closer, but you're probably right. If it's 25 mm, 
that starts yeah. to look like a material difference. I think the number starts at double. I think that if it goes from five mm -hmm. to 10%, all of a sudden it's like, no, you that that was not disclosed. 10% yeah, of it's, its users is too high. That's kind of yeah. why I picked eight, is I think eight is about the upper limit of what I would, you know, if I were the chancery judge here, that I would say that that, that, that is included in that provision that you knew, you said about 5%, 8% is not a material difference, you knew. Well, like I said, but, in, in the terrible universe version of Twitter here, they know that there's an issue and they're and they're moving data around and trying to hide from this crazy person. Um, like that's, that's the terrible version of all of this. Um, oh I hope that's not the case, right? Like I don't want fraud on the market. I don't want people to invested their, you know, pension fund dollars in a company that's lying. So I would prefer that not to be the case. Uh, yeah. but you know, I don't know. I don't know. Finally and critically, Twitter negotiated for itself a robust right to demand specific performance of the agreement's terms that encompass the right to compel defendants to close the deal and ensure that Musk personally was bound by that provision. Yes. So you could, you could say that we've got that. I, I think I can pull that up. That is at the bottom of the termination provision. I've almost I'm memorized this deal, Mark. Wow. That's I crazy. I didn't draft this. You really I'm are an MMA &M &M guy. <laughs> um, I'd imagine that they are, they're kind of phrasing this in the strongest way possible. And when I actually read section nine, I'm going to be like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, the main issue that they have is what it says isn't really anything so much. It says, hey, you owe us a billion dollars if we terminate this, but it's the same kind of our remedies aren't otherwise destroyed if we decide to use that kind of language. Right. So it says we can instead force you to close, but the requirement there is that we're fully ready to close. That right. there's nothing that we've got right. a problem with in yeah. 7172. Um, and oh, you said you said nine off the top of your head, and I went I went too far. I'll, I'll no, find it. No, it was later. nine. It, it was nine, but that's okay. We will talk. Uh, it is actually uh, eight. Right. Um, parents right to receive uh, payment from the company, the termination fee. That's the billion dollars. Uh, shall constitute the sole and exclusive remedy, um, uh, except in the case of knowing this, it's, it's in here somewhere. Uh, I'll look for it later. Yeah, I don't want to bother we don't have to, yeah, everybody. Just... Uh, but yes, it says that they can force the deal as long as, yeah, I should be looking for seven, one and seven, two. That's the provision that says that it says it says it's in nine somewhere. I mean, I'm, I'm not looking at it anymore, but that's certainly what I remember. That was like All nine right. nine or something. But oh, nine nine specific performance. Uh, yes, irreparable damage. We can. Force I'm a things. lawyer too. You did it. Yes. <laughs> Notwithstanding anything here into the contrary, including the availability of the parent termination fee, despite the fact that we could ask for a billion dollars if we wanted to, it is hereby acknowledged and agreed that the company shall be entitled to specific performance or other equitable remedy to enforce parent and acquisition sub. That's Elon and his obligations to cause the equity investor, that's literally Elon, to fund the equity financing or to enforce the equity investor's obligation to fund the equity financing directly and to consummate the closing if and for so long as, and we'll get to that in just a second. But suffice to say, right, this is a company that didn't trust Elon Musk. They just swallowed an enormous poison pill. He is forcing their fiduciary hand on this stuff. So they negotiate for a section that says, yeah, we just asked for a billion dollars in liquidated damages, but that's not like an option for you. That's our option is what this, that's what this language says. Because people have asked me, people have come to my comments and said, well, can he just, couldn't he just spend the billion and it all goes away? It's like, no, no, it's it's not his option right. It's Twitter's option right. Yeah, um, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> and, and and look, and I think in in their defense, or I, I don't think anyone's necessarily attacking them for this, but but this is extremely rushed for a buyout. It, and it's very God, public yes. and it's very quick. And so having sort of things like this I mean, if I were negotiating this, this is something I would push hard for because I don't want you to just be doing this to, as a ploy out in the public and then just be able to walk away. And yeah. for those who don't know the specific terminology, specific performance is is that exact right that not only can I sue you for damages and get paid whatever the expected value I would get paid out of this deal is if you breach. No, I can make you do it. If we're contracting to paint my house and you don't paint my house, I can make you do the specific performance of painting my house, which is extremely uncommon. And it is. It's a lot of it's a lot of stuff that we don't like to force people to paint other people's houses. Yeah, um, the court might not enforce that, depending. This is a little different because it's a big multi-billion dollar transaction. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. I'm trying to make it smaller. You know, I'm trying to make it understandable of why specific performance is the sort of thing why we wouldn't do it. Is we don't want we don't want you to have to paint someone else's house. And frankly, you probably painted bad, and then we meet up back in court because you didn't paint the house good enough. Um, but but <laughs> but this is based on how quickly Musk was doing this. This is a real section so far. Now we're going to see the classic lawyer. Hey, here's the strong point. 
Now, here's all the exceptions to the point, which is, as you can see, 70% of the paragraph rather than the top I was gonna 30%. Say, if I were betting, man, this is this is Twitter's request. And this is Twitter, and this is Elon's counsel's turn, right? Right, it's exactly. Like, long as we got a few conditions. And the big one is, we're not going to go through this whole thing, but the, the big one is, is that Twitter can actually close the deal, right? All of the conditions set forth in section 7.1 and 7.2, which is that company has fulfilled all of its obligations under the agreement and the reps and warranties are still true, that those are still accurate, that we can otherwise sit at the table and ask for your money. And the issue here principally is that I don't know that this provision does a ton when the fight is you breached your obligations to me, right? right? Yeah, so that's fair. I already said if if the, if Elon's wrong there, he's in trouble. Um, I don't know that this like makes him doubly in trouble. It, it's it's more a belt and suspenders make Twitter feel better about this situation than anything else, as I read it, because you do have to have met your conditions. They have to be satisfied, or if they're only required at closing, capable of being satisfied. And here, if Elon's right, and their bots are out of business, and it's a big problem, and their SEC filings are wrong, which they promised is not the case, you can't cure that in retrospect. There's not a cure for false old SEC filings. Right. Um, and so they can't meet their 7.2 obligation here and they can't force a deal. So like we're still in the same place we would have been in, but Twitter feels better about it. And more importantly for Twitter, as we discuss it at this point in time, they can mention it here. <laughs> right. We negotiated to make him your honor. What more can we do? Well, <laughs> there's a few conditions to that. Um, I also got a super chat here from somebody we know. If I can. Yeah, I saw that. He, he, uncivil's bugging you, Mark. I know. He's saying, when are we starting for the part? You see, Uncivil Law and I, for those who don't know, we live in fairly close proximity, and we're both uh, currently taking the Texas part in two weeks. Um, so I, I am a member of the California bar, but because I did my dalliance for years in um, producing reality television, basically, um, I thought that it was my ethical obligation to take the bar and not try and wave in. Um, which is insane. And so we're supposed to be studying together. And yes, you're right, Uncivil Law, I have mm -hmm. not called you. I do want you to know that uh, your phone is not a bat phone. You can make calls on it as well. Oh, wow. Wow. Just saying. Just saying, <laughs> dude. That, like, uh, you put it's all on me. Uh, you know? <laughs> see, look, we're, we're, we're having antics here. We're talking about antics and multi-billion dollar corporations and multi-billion dollar fathers of nine. We're having a good time here this evening. Tell your friends, folks. I'm like really trying to balance. I know that there are a lot of people who are joining this stream to go through a 62-page, like, mergers and acquisition baby. complaint. But yeah. I also know that there's some people who are just tuning in because they see the notification. And I want to make sure that they're having fun, too. You know? Oh, I agree entirely. No, no, yeah. no. This would be the driest mm -hmm. thing in the world if we just rolled <laughs> through this sentence by sentence. So, folks, like I said, chat. If you want to chat about something that you see that you have a question on, you think we went through too fast, you think we skipped something, you think we're just morons and you'd like to share it with us via chat, let me know. I am yeah. in on this. It's a live broadcast. Absolutely. You can see Kurt super chatting because he wants to get Mark's attention. If you want to get Mark's attention, you can feel free to super chat. But even and just adding me will get his attention as well. Oh, All now right. he's pretending that he doesn't have my number. Oh, now I'm just going to text him. Oh, this is going to be bad. This is going to be bad, Kurt. <laughs> uh, we, have a, we have a slight sojourn here from the next Super Chat. Scott G says, will you look at how the Artesian builds bankruptcy? Like how the head had his parents as secured creditors while people who bought or RMA aid their system got their computer taken? So uh, this is just between you, me, and 600 or so of our closest friends on the stream. I actually have to look... I actually have to look at um, uh, what I can and can't say about that particular deal. For right now, you do know that I have two or three episodes on Artesian Builds. I've had other communications that I have to actually look at my records to see if they otherwise affect what I can say as to what just came out uh, mm -hmm. from Gamers Nexus. I've watched that video. I may comment on it, uh, but I have to be careful there. And that's basically all I can say right now. But I do know that it's an issue and I will look into it. I promise. Joe Mendoza, wait, Mark used to or still does produce reality uh, television shows? Anything you <laughs> would recognize, Mark? Uh, I don't know. The The last one that I had the, the most involved with, with I've, I've developed uh, about five, 
five to seven shows that have been sold into development deals, but only uh, two, uh, one or two of them have made air. Um, which, you know, honestly, it's pretty good odds because I wasn't producing reality for a long time. But um, on A&E, um, there's a show called WWE's Most Wanted Treasures. Um, and it's basically kind of a, um, an American Pickers style thing. But basically the idea is WWE wants to open up a hall physical Hall of Fame. But, oh no, it doesn't have 95% of the memorabilia. It's lost to time. It's out there somewhere. And if we want to open up a Hall of Fame, we got to get it back. So we're scouring the globe looking for these kind of memorabilia from famous matches or like the first outfit that someone wore or these sort of boots. And who better to send out to sweeten the pot for these private collectors than the superstars themselves? And so sometimes they don't want money. They don't really care. These, these things are so important to these collectors that really it's more the one-to-one -one human experience. And one of the things I really appreciate about the show is it plays a lot like a, a, a pay-in to, um, to wrestling fans and kind of how serious we all get, how weird we are. And it really highlights a lot of kind of fun weirdness of us. Um, and yeah, like guys will take zero dollars for this thing that they've had in their collection for 12 years, as long as Mick Foley will show up with him and their friends and watch a paper they're choosing and talk about it, you know? <laughs> and that's like, that's super cool, you know? So anyway, that was, that's now in season two. I no longer have anything to do with it anymore because WWE decided they don't like my division very much. Even though I got multiple shows on air on a and &E, I'm not mad. I'm not bitter. But right now, quite frankly, not working for WWE looks like it's working out better for me. I was going to say, you could be in that maelstrom, right? Well, ironically, I know a lot about that maelstrom. <laughs> say no more. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying anymore. Um, some people can ask me off air, and I'll think about what I want to say or not say. But I, I know basically everyone involved in that in a way that, um, you know, I care about a lot of things. So. I don't blame you for that. Well, that has been our WWE and uh, reality <laughs> TV show Sojourn uh, back in the ultra- important and serious world of tech titans and social media empires. At a board meeting on April 25th, 2022, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan each presented their fairness opinions and the board discussed the agreement. So those are financial reports that essentially say this price is fair. It doesn't mean that it's right. It means that it falls within a range that a board can feel comfortable accepting should they choose to do so. And if you've ever seen one of these things, it's all ranges down the board. These reports will say, here are the comparables, here are the EBITDA multiples, here's whatever else you could take into account. And we find a price that goes from here to here, $54 is within that range, whatever it might be. And that gives the board the insurance that they need to accept these kinds of things. That's a fairness opinion, but it's not what some people think it is, which is a guarantee that the price is the best price or that it's somehow a good price. It's, it's that the range falls in an area where you're not immediately going to die when the stockholders sue you. The board ultimately approved the merger agreement and decided to recommend stockholder approval, which is a necessary step under Delaware law, both because the price was fair to stockholders and because the merger agreement promised a high level of closing certainty. It's cash. It's Elon Musk. What could be more certain? Twitter had taken Musk's claimed seller-friendly draft agreement and secured other key concessions to make it even more so. Not only were there no financing or diligence conditions, but Musk had already secured debt commitments that together with his personal equity commitment would suffice to fund the purchase. Twitter had been buffeted by Mar Musk's re reversals before. For the benefit of stockholders and employees, the board needed assurance that this agreement would stick. It received that assurance in the terms it was able to negotiate. Twitter's board out there doing work for you, stockholder that's reading this lawsuit. Uh, and we want you to know, Court of Chancery, that we negotiated these things specifically because of areas of sensitivity that we had to Elon Musk doing, unfortunately, exactly what he's doing at issue in this case, right? That's the rhetoric right there. Uh, Mark, you want to take section three, uh, what, part of it at least for a little bit? Totally. Yeah, absolutely. You got a lot to read and I'm not going to be here forever. So let me take a little bit of the burden off you. <clears throat> section three, the final agreed upon deal terms. The terms of the transaction are governed by the merger agreement executed on April 25th, 2022. Under the agreement at closing, Acquisition Sub will merge into Twitter and Twitter will continue as a private corporation owned by Musk through his wholly owned shell companies. 
uh, Twitter stockholders will receive fifty-four twenty per share, and the company's common stock will be delisted in the New York Stock from the New York Stock Exchange. Closing conditions: the closing uh, the conditions to closing are few. The transaction is subject to a majority vote of Twitter stockholders and to specified regulatory approvals. The deal is also conditioned on the non-occurrence of a company material adverse effect that is continuing at the time of closing, which we have read about and will certainly continue to read about. The agreement contains various representations by Twitter, including that its SEC filings since January 1st at the time filed or at the time amended or supplemented are complete and accurate in all material aspects, fairly depict the financial condition of the company in all material aspects, and were prepared in accordance with the GAAP. Any inaccuracy in these representations does not excuse closing unless it rises to the level of a CMAE. Uh, and then we have the CMAE is defined as any change effect. Oh, did we read this already? Change event effect. Well, we didn't read the top, which... but I did comment on it in one of my videos, which is, this particular definition, and there's not really great ways to do this here, but it's pure lawyer definition. It, it's yeah. absolutely tautological. A material adverse effect is a material adverse effect. Yep. Nailed it. Uh, but it is on the business financial conditional results of operations. We fight a lot about prospects here. Prospects didn't make it in. Good job. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, there are negotiations on those points. Basically, it means a bad thing happening to the company. Does anything like... Do the, do the definitional sections of that really tend to... Have you seen the definitional effects of sections like that really make any difference? No, it's just problematic because you get into these fights about what... I mean, this doesn't give you anything to go on. It doesn't have a lodestar, right? So it's what's right. material, what's adverse, uh, you know? And so you wind up with, if you're going to rely on this to get out of a deal, you got some work ahead of you. Because we don't know what that even means. And one of the things right. that Elon Musk doesn't do in his letter is tie the bot issue to like a value quantification, uh, right? Like ordinarily, if you're going to use this, you'd say, okay, and if there's a bot issue, then the SEC is going to have an issue. And if the SEC has an issue, then we would expect the value of the company to be reduced by 20%, something that is material. Um, because when you're talking about proving this, you'd have to, you'd have to hit that materiality concept. Um, and again, Elon plays fast and loose, um, with what he actually says. So one of the things that happens in his letter is he says, for instance, uh, there's a 30 day window for you to cure something like the information breach. Uh, and you were aware of that when we told you we, you were in breach in whatever that is the June 8th letter. Yeah. I, I said, as a lawyer, I said, well, he says that, uh, you are aware that this is a breach. That, that's not really a notice to cure. Like that's that's not a document nope. that says you're in breach and you have till X and we're and, and it's a termination kind of setup. So they're they're using that and they're kind of tying it. And then and Skadden says, and that goes back a month before we sent the letter. It's like, oh, okay, all right, hold on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so everything is kind of fast and loose in the Musk regime. Um, and I think probably historically he's gotten away with that on certain aspects of this. He might hear, um, but it's it's not how I like to do things. I would button that up. I would have a notice of breach. Uh, you know, I would say, this is what it is. This is the section. Here is the section that talks about our termination, right? You have 30 days to comply. Like I would, I would lay it out. I mean, yeah, but this is the world we're living in. You know, it's, I, I love the idea that somewhere on some lawyer's computer, on some server, some law firm server, there is like a very meticulously ordered folder for, you know, for the, the Twitter deal and the, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then it says offer letter, one offer letter, dash, open it up, it's like a GIF of a screenshot of a text. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> like, like that's the world we're in now. You know? That could be so, in the closing transcript. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It's just, but... a, it's just a text message. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Uh, as one would expect with a seller-friendly merger agreement, the contract identifies numerous changes, events, and circumstances expressly excluded from the determination of whether a CMAE has occurred. Changes, oh, you want to- Yeah, yeah I mean, we can do this quick style. Yep. So this is changes generally affecting the marketplace, that's standard, general economic downturns. And again, the idea of this definition, right, is that if there is a material adverse event, um, here just a fact, but- Oftentimes there's two definitions here. Uh, if there is one of those kinds of things, then the buyer doesn't necessarily have to buy. And so what we exclude from that are things that aren't unique to Twitter, right? right. So you don't get to walk away if the whole world, if all hell broke loose, if an asteroid destroys Manhattan and that crushes the markets, 
that doesn't get you out of this deal because it didn't have anything to do with the way Twitter does its business. And this is a binding merger agreement. So any condition that affects the general industry or market that doesn't do anything, any economic, regulatory, or political downturn. Here we have what they added, the, the presence of Elon, yeah. the, the negotiation by Elon, any litigation claim or legal proceeding threatened or initiated uh, in each case arising out of or relating to this agreement. So the fact that we entered into an agreement with you and that might lower our value, none of that can be used against us. All of this is legitimate from Twitter's negotiation standpoint and yeah. it changes in the market price. Hey, the, did you check out the stock market? It's not doing awesome. That isn't our fault that you took on that risk when you signed your name to that page. That is your risk on signing. And so you don't get out of it. And then that any manner disclosed in the company SEC document. So we, we did look at it, uh, although it's you'll note, it's much better formatted here for the, for the judge's eyes than it is in the actual merger agreement itself. Yeah, I did notice that. Um, all right. <clears throat> the parties thus agreed that any circumstance affecting the market generally, oh, this is just what you said, or other social media companies would not excuse the defendants from closing, nor would any circumstance arising from the existence or performance of the agreement or from any communication by Musk, quote, including the impact of any of the foregoing on any of the Twitter's relationships with, among customers. Oh, pardon me one second. No worries. <laughs> Oh, we have an appearance. Hey, yeah. baby, attractive nuisance. Oh, I'm just, I'm here with my friend, Rick. Look at, say hey. Say hey, everyone. Hey. 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 Oh, yeah, well, that's true. So what did you come up here to tell me? Is it dinner time? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, hey, thank you for having me, Mr. Rick. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, everybody, who sent me nice stuff in the comments. I did, in fact, read it. I am one of those comment readers. I don't listen to Rick um have a great day everybody. <laughs> i'm echoing right now so i'm going to talk very little but thank you so much for joining me and that's mark everybody he got called for dinner uh by a beautiful babe uh and you're left with me talking through the remaining 40 some odd pages of this document so uh like i said hopefully we can skip some aspects of this as we proceed on but i do think the fact pattern here at least as twitter sees it uh is important uh so we're gonna we're gonna press through here so they agreed that the general economic downturns aren't going to affect them. Things that are related to it being Musk aren't going to qualify as material adverse effects. Likewise, matters that Twitter disclosed in sections of its SEC filings other than risk factors and forward-looking statements cannot constitute a company material adverse effect. And Twitter's failure to meet financial projections will not excuse closing unless that failure results from an occurrence independently qualifying as that material adverse effect, taking into account all those exclusions. The agreement also makes clear that financing is not a condition. Notwithstanding anything contained in this agreement to the contrary, the equity investor parent and acquisition sub, the Elon Musk entities, acknowledge and affirm that it is not a condition of the closing or to any of its obligations under the agreement that the Elon Musk entities or their affiliates obtain any financing. Nor is there any diligence condition. Indeed, each of parent and acquisition sub represents that it conducted to its satisfaction its own independent investigation, review, and analysis of the business. Uh, and hold on, I just got a dot here. Hey, Kurt, welcome. You want help some reading? Oh, sure. We can do some reading together. Uh, hang on one second. A analysis of the business, results of operations, prospects, conditions, or assets of the company and its subsidiaries, and that in determining to proceed with the merger, each relied solely on the results of its own independent review and analysis in the merger agreement. Uh, parent and acquisition sub, again, that's the Musk folks, further acknowledge that neither the company nor any of its subsidiaries nor any other person makes or has made or is making any express or implied representation or warranty with respect to the company or any of its subsidiaries or the respective business or operations in each case, other than those is expressly stated. We're not making other promises other than what appears in black and white within the agreement. And this is, again, where Twitter thinks that they've negotiated like the complete cessation of diligence. They're wrong there, but certainly there's a lot of language that does suggest that it should be a limited and targeted bit of diligence that Elon Musk is entitled to. Kurt, you want to read some? I'd love to. The agreement requires all parties, including Musk, to use their reasonable best efforts to consummate the merger and cause all the closing conditions to be satisfied. Defendants, including, including Musk, have a hell or high water obligation to close on their financing commitments for that transaction. I know that actually has operative law in some places. That's badass. Mm -hmm. They must take or cause be taken all actions and do or cause be done all things necessary, proper or advisable to arrange, obtain and consummate the financing at or prior to closing on terms and subject to conditions set forth in the financing commitments. Just out of pure curiosity, where are they getting hell or high water? Because 
they did they didn't use that language or they just I, I think they mean it more as rhetorical. Uh, yeah. Hell or high water doesn't appear in the agreement as far as I know. Uh, okay. they're 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 I think they're describing it here to indicate they had the highest level of uh, obligation and commitment. It caught me it caught me by surprise because I know in some states that language actually has operative effects. So it mm -hmm. caught me by surprise. Uh, anyways, I don't, like it when, I don't like it when um, uh, law understandings give effect to idioms, uh, <laughs> but 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 there we are. Yeah, some, yeah, anyways, we move on. More specifically, <laughs> Musk and Parent have an unconditional obligation to take or cause to be taken all actions and do or cause to be done all things necessary, proper, proper or advisable to obtain the equity financing, which includes, among other things, Musk funding of his personal equity commitment at or before closing. Right. And we're still doing background here, but they're clearly prepping for he's not doing his job on this stuff. He isn't gathering the money. He told us he wouldn't need to do much, uh, that the money was already there sitting at the table. And we're going to circle around back on this because there's some issue with the financing that they're going to raise as part of this document. Either that or they're wasting our time, but I don't think so. Um, so then we got information sharing, which is where Elon Musk claims the breach occurs. Okay, the merger agreement requires the parties to share certain information with one another in the run-up to closing. Defendants, including Musk, are required to keep Twitter reasonably informed on a current basis of the status of their efforts to arrange and finalize the financing and to promptly provide and respond to any updates reasonably requested by the company with respect to the status of those efforts. For its part, Twitter is required to use commercially reasonable best efforts to assist defendants with arranging financing, but that obligation is qualified. Twitter need not prepare or provide any financial statements or other financial information other than financial information provided to the SEC, nor provide any other information that is not available to the company without undue effort or expense. Moreover, Twitter's obligations under Section 6.11 are its sole obligation with respect to cooperation in connection with the arrangement of any financing, and Twitter may be considered to have breached the provision only if failure by parent to obtain the committed debt financing is due solely to deliberate action or omission taken or omitted to be taken by the company in material breach of its obligations. Right. So Twitter has the kind of less uh, hell or high water-esque obligation to help out with whatever Elon Musk's financing sources might otherwise need, mm. but doesn't have to create things, doesn't have to go and do the extra mile to make sure that he can get that information. Because Elon Musk, according to Twitter, and this is reflected in the merger agreement itself, has basically said that the money is there and that we don't really need to worry about where it comes from. All right, the next section starts one more paragraph. So you want to do one more, Kurt? No problem. Are we at paragraph 15? Uh, 50, yeah. Yeah. Subject to certain conditions, including entry into a confidentiality agreement, Twitter must provide parent and its advisors with reasonable access to information about its business, properties, and personnel, as defendants reasonably request. The information requested must be for reasonable business purposes related to the consummation of the transactions contemplated by this agreement. So these, the information about how many bots you have doesn't fall into that mold. Right. So here's the fight, right? So 6.4, and I can swing this up, I think. Uh, six well, re four. Relate, related to is very open language. It is very broad. That's right. And that's one of the things I said in my videos is, look, sophisticated parties, you know how to not say it as this red portion says, and yet you didn't deign to do so. Uh, you will give us everything at our expense. So it's not an expense issue. You'll give us access to your employers. You'll give us access to your books and records. You'll give us access to everything that may be reasonably requested in writing. And they're not really fighting that it's a reasonable request, honestly. But in each case, for any reasonable business purpose, any reasonable business purpose, mind you, related any. to I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Right. So this is a very broad descriptor here. And Elon Musk is using, depending on which side you think is happening, he's using that loophole as a truck to drive through. Or he's well, it's using not my it fault. I didn't write the language. You wrote the language. It's, it's, it sounds like a you problem. You know? Well, and, and this is Elon Musk's pro offered agreement. So, I mean, mm -hmm. but it, these are sophisticated parties. No one's going to win on a, uh, we didn't write the deal uh, here, but this is very broad. Uh, and mm -hmm. if I were the court, one argument that might hold for me is you guys know how to write it. So it's not this broad and you let Elon Musk write it this broadly. Um, and for any reasonable business purpose, that's pretty large related to pretty large. And then what does it mean to be related to the consummation of the transactions? I want to know what I'm buying is related to the consummation of the transactions, isn't it? Sounds like it to me. So this serves to me as a between signing and closing diligence kind of concept. I flagged it when the issue was first raised way back at the top of the playlist. And I, I think 
that it does enough damage. Now, what, what you see is that we knew this from the uh, between the lines readings of the letters that we saw, and we only saw a couple of them out of like 10 that were actually filed with the SEC, mm -hmm. that this was a fight that Twitter was having. That Twitter says that what you're requesting is outside the bounds of this right here. Mm -hmm. And I think Twitter makes a lot of good points or potential good points in this document and in their arguments. This, I don't think, is one of them. No. Um, so to me, it really comes down to whether Twitter, whether Elon Musk is basically asking reasonable things and whether Twitter has at least nominally been trying to comply with them. Like that's where this fight lives to me. Yeah. In addition, Twitter can decline a request if, in its reasonable judgment, it determines that compliance would cause significant competitive harm to the company or its subsidiaries. If the transactions contemplated by this agreement are not consummated, I'm not even sure what that means theoretically, or would violate applicable law, including privacy laws. What does that even yeah, mean hypothetically? So, so I mean, because they're giving it to they're giving it to Elon. How would any information they give to Elon hurt its competitive advantage, unless they're thinking that Elon's going to like. He'll spit it on Open nose Yeah, no, I don't think so. Yeah. That but they're not arguing sense. about competitive advantage, or they haven't yet. Maybe that's in this document. Mm. They haven't argued that they just don't trust their buyer because that's a <laughs> that's an unusual set of circumstances for your merger agreement where you're selling out in cash uh, to this individual. Just generalized um, principles of good faith and fair dealing go a long way too. Yes, yeah. And not only that, it's basically codified here. There's effectively a good faith and fair dealing provision. Uh, in this agreement. So I, I, they don't really have that kind of risk here. I'm just trying to see whether that lives in this section or not. And I'm not sure that it does, at least in what I captured. But I, this is cut so that we could we could read it more clearly. Oh, here it is, right? So company or any of its subsidiaries uh, don't have to do this, provided, however, they don't have to disclose. If in their reasonable judgment, it would cause significant competitive harm if the transactions are not consummated, violate law or jeopardize their privilege. Privilege, sure. Law, sure. And this is, allows for them to effectively contemplate that the deal falls through. And if that's the face, case of their reasonable judgment, they can hold back the information. So this is an interesting kind of defensive point for Twitter, right? So Elon- That seems a, odd. I don't quite understand. It seems like it's circle leading its own tail. Yes, right? So, I mean, like, all right, let's say, let's say that they actually have a lot more bots than they're saying. Uh, if that information were to come out, it's competitive harm, right? But they can't say that. So they're not actually invoking that provision in anything that we have seen so far. Maybe they invoke it in this document, but this provision essentially, I don't know, it's a little bit like pleading the corporate fifth. If you have to say, I'm not going to turn over the information because it represents significant competitive harm. Like I can understand, I guess we're not going to turn over our patent portfolio other than to make sure that you know it exists. Uh, but well, if it's anything that's been filed with the office and published, it's all in the record anyway. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, well, or trade secrets. I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out what it is that they could hold back on mm. here that would still allow them to get $44 billion and not worry about it. Because if it were to, if the deal were to fall apart, we wouldn't want it in Elon Musk's hands. It's very interesting. And, and we'll see if they actually wind up using that. But that is part of this section 6.4. Okay, I can read some more if you like. Did we finish that paragraph? I'll yes. do some. Okay. So the ordinary course covenant, and this is the argument about Twitter firing a bunch of people. The agreement contains a seller-friendly ordinary course covenant requiring Twitter to use no more than its commercially reasonable efforts to conduct the business to the company and subsidiaries in the ordinary course of business, unless, among other things, an action outside the ordinary course is agreed to in writing by parent, which is Elon, which consent shall not be unreasonably withheld the later condition, which that parenthetical is the strong way of saying you'll give us the consent in almost all instances. There is no requirement of compliance with past practice, and as noted, before the agreement was signed, Twitter succeeded in striking from the covenant a requirement to obtain parent's consent for the hiring and firing of employees yes on a one-off basis we'll see what they say about their uh, mass layoffs that we saw announced uh, earlier public statements and non-disparagement we just went over this today in our video section 6.8 contains standard language requiring each side to consult with the other before issuing certain public statements as well as negotiated language concerning musk's ability to tweet about the merger under the provision musk may so tweet only so long as such tweets do not disparage the company or any of its representatives and there was a fight like the day after the agreement was actually announced that suggested that Musk had disparaged the company. I looked over that in a video here in this space. I found it to be wanting. To yeah, I remember that. Out. I don't remember. Yeah, it was, it was, it was lame. Yeah, I don't think it's the world's strongest argument. We'll see if Twitter brings it up here. Uh, I also wanted to uh, give effect to this super chat. Uh, Rifka Muhammad, DD is standard fare in an acquisition. Due diligence, absolutely. Sure. Uh, but this is obviously an unusual transaction insofar as it signed up very quickly 
after being texted to an executive of a public corporation. Um, so I think diligence still survives basically through 6.4 and some other provisions in the agreement that don't get as much press. Well, the agreement um, with the, the the clause we just read is contemplating due diligence. It's like, I want, I want the ability to get information that's relevant in any way to the deal so that I can do my due diligence. So, And Twitter okay. says it's not, right? Twitter says that that provision was only designed to get us to the deal closing and not to do anything mm -hmm. else in terms of investigating the company. So, uh, I mean, th this is the fight that you have. This is why all of these are novel. This is why we can only speak in generalities and say facts and circumstances. And we can't speak for what the specific judge in the court of chancery will say is because all these contracts are differently drafted. And there's at least a reason to fight on both sides for facts that we don't know that mm. whether Elon asked things that were reasonable, he describes them as reasonable. That's great. That's what you would expect from him. We don't know whether they were. So if this proceeded to a lawsuit and honestly, these things rarely do, but maybe when you've got $50 billion or so on the line is what actually happened with respect to these requests. And did Twitter engage in good faith and fair dealing with trying to comply with them? Um, but thank you very much for the super chat. Absolutely. Due diligence standard. If you're going to spend $50 billion, you're going to look at some stuff, even if you're Elon Musk. Termination. Defendant's ability to terminate the agreement before the presumptive drop dead date of October 24th, 2022 is extremely limited and carefully circumscribed. While there are closing conditions related to the accuracy of Twitter's representations and warranties, good to acknowledge that, and to Twitter's compliance with its covenants, good to acknowledge that as well, there is no right for defendants to terminate unless there is a breach sufficiently significant to cause failure of a closing condition, which after due notice is either incapable of being cured or is not cured within 30 days after such notice. Now that's not an unusual description of termination. Twitter's trying to say that it's super Twitter, pro Twitter here. No, that's not the case. This, this particular right to terminate that Elon has is basically give or take standard course. If the company shall have breached or failed to perform any of its reps, warranties, covenants, or other agreements, which breach or failure to perform would give rise to the failure of a condition set forth in 7.2, which are the provisions that say that Twitter can comply with its obligations and that Twitter's reps and warranties are accurate and it's not capable of being cured or is not cured by the company on or before the earlier of the termination date, which is that October date, or the date that is 30 days following parents delivery of written notice, then Elon can terminate the agreement, which is to say, if Twitter does something wrong and Elon calls them out for it, they have 30 days to fix it. Or if it's the kind of thing that is wrong that can't be fixed, like for instance, filed false SEC documents, then he can terminate effectively immediately when he determines that that is in fact the breach. I don't know what they are referring to as this being particularly pro Twitter. Those provisions strike me as relatively market standard uh, for a termination right that a buyer might otherwise hold. Um. Defendants have no right to terminate. Moreover, if any of them are in material breach of their own obligations under the agreement, which is, of course, the fight here. Twitter may seek specific performance, an injunction or other equitable relief to enforce any of defendants obligations under the merger agreement. We looked at that earlier. It has the specific power to compel Musk to fund the equity financing and close the merger, provided the closing conditions are met. The debt financing has been or will be funded at the closing and the company is itself prepared to close. And then you see the commitments to financing also. Covered. So you can you can speak to this issue. What is the uh, viability of getting specific performance generally in these kinds of issues? The specific the Delaware, performance generally is basically borderline impossible, except in real property. So is that different here? The Delaware Court of Chancery is one of the courts in the country that is most willing to have specific performance as uh, as a uh, remedy uh, okay. for cases such as this. And I actually went over a case very recently that effectively had a bad actor or the, what the court found to be a bad actor try to scuttle its financing and walk away from a deal. And the court forced them to close and said, we don't even care that you're saying, well, I can't get financing now. You go figure it out. Um, and this is very recent in a not dissimilar set of circumstances. Obviously, in size, it's dissimilar. I think it was a, it was a bakery uh, or a, like a cake company. Um, but it was... Um, it was forced. Um, and you can see that it's a link in my video from uh, when Elon uh, terminated the deal. Um, so you can, you can check that out. But the Court of Chancery is, as any court is, going to be reluctant to use that power. But I think if we're looking at things, I don't have stats behind me on this, but I have seen enough orders to deals to close that they are more willing to do that than the average court. Because as I've said earlier, Courts don't like to force people to do things. It's not a great outcome. Here, this is an exchange of money. Here, Elon Musk wanted it at some point. And it's, you know, huge corporations that are sophisticated parties. I think the Court of Chancery takes that all into account 
uh, and decides for a specific performance more often than kind of the average Joe. Okay. Financing structure. At the time of signing, the financing for the transaction had three components, loans to the post-closing Twitter, a personal loan on margin to Musk against his Tesla stock, and an equity commitment from Musk himself. The loans to Twitter of up to $13 billion in the aggregate are promised by Morgan Stanley Senior Funding and other lenders in a debt commitment letter dated April 25th, 2022. The committed financing comprises a $6.5 billion term loan, a $500 million revolving credit facility, and $6 billion of bridge financing. We looked at all of this earlier, so I'm going to skip most of this section, I think. There's a margin loan that helps him out. The point that Twitter is making here with these terms is that Elon had documentation when they agreed to the merger agreement that suggested that there really wasn't a condition of financing, both in the language of the document, we saw them reference that, and mm -hmm. in the actual facts of the debt letter commitments that he already had. So Twitter is trying to Musk establish- Musk isn't arguing financing, is he? Uh, he? He might be. So here's the thing. Musk hasn't said that in public. In the introduction to this agreement, they have suggested that Musk was slow rolling whatever was required for financing and isn't doing what he has promised to do with respect to that financing. We actually haven't gotten to the point in this document where they accuse him of specific things there, but they're setting up that the Twitter board, it was important to them that financing wasn't an issue. He had all these letters. He had the cash directly. It was margined on Tesla stock, which is what they're also going to say is a problem for Elon Musk when this when the market downturns, um, but otherwise uh, that they had done their diligence and did what they were supposed to do. Um, and it does look like we have a super chat from Papa Hogue here. Hey, Dad. Certainly, the number of false users, bots being used for ad revenue and value projections must be verifiable. No, it's a big enterprise, Dad. You don't think Twitter could maybe just not have all the details on that? You're not you're not giving them the benefit of the doubt on this. You're on Team Musk. Uh, for them not turning over the data that they should otherwise be turning over? The answer is, Dad, I don't know uh, the answer to that question. And I don't know whether what Twitter turned over to Elon Musk would be standard for, for instance, their industry in terms of what information they have. They've talked about doing sample tests, statistical tests to determine what their bot levels are. Those could be bad. They could be poorly done. I believe Elon Musk refers to them as ad hoc and arbitrary in the letter that he files to the SEC, which, you know, again, these are not the things I would say in that context, but that's what he did. Um, but they also could be fine. And I'm not the right person to ask about uh, the statistician's evaluation of the bots that either live or don't live on Twitter. Um, I can see things both ways. Uh, Elon says his requests were perfectly normal and they should have been able to provide that data. I believe what we're going to get to is that Twitter is going to say that they weren't perfectly normal and they shouldn't be able to provide that data, right? So I think that's where we are at with this particular issue. Um, so that's the structure of financing meant that the merger could become significantly more expensive for him if Tesla's stock price were to decline. That's the margin component of his loan. And that leads directly into the market dies. Mm -hmm. We're all living in the United States. We know. Mm -hmm. we, we, we know complaint. You don't have to tell us. The risk of market decline, which was Musk's alone to bear under the merger agreement because of his margin call. Soon after signing, the U.S. capital markets took a turn for the worse. Within a week after April 25th, 2022, the date the merger agreement was executed, Musk elected to sell roughly 10 million Tesla shares to finance the merger at prices as low as $822 per share, substantially below the pre-Twitter signing price of $1,005 per share. So he's getting less bang for his buck on the Tesla stock. He that's, then uh, what, two, that's $2 billion? Yeah. That loss? It's a lot of money. <laughs> so you lost $2 billion on that. Okay, that's, not, that's good. Yep. Yeah, but he did liquidate his position. Um, and so, you know, there are there are other issues uh, potentially with that. I, I don't know whether Tesla will come into play in this story at all, but they might. He then will help him out his taxes this year as he has a huge capital gain loss. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are going to have a capital gain loss. Mm -hmm. He then promptly tweeted no further Tesla sales planned after today. But the Tesla stock price kept dropping, putting Musk at risk of needing to pledge yet more Tesla shares to consummate his proposed margin loan and to sell still more to fund his equity commitment. On May 4th, Parent and Musk, faced with needing to pledge more Tesla shares to satisfy the condition that the margin loan not exceed 20% of the value of the pledged stock, decreased the amount of that loan. So here he's modifying his existing, thank you, Heading. He's modifying his existing loan commitments here. This is where Twitter is going to start to get squeegee. On May 24th, without notifying Twitter, they dispensed with the loan entirely. He gets rid of his Tesla margin loan and agreed in a new equity commitment letter to increase his equity commitment to $33.5 billion. That letter, which remains operative, gives Twitter third-party beneficiary rights to enforce directly against Musk 
his equity commitment in accordance with its terms and the terms of the merger agreement, presumably if it's if there's an actual closing consummated. But I don't have this document in front of me. So mm -hmm. this is important. I didn't know this detail. I don't know if this detail had been revealed. Musk drops his Tesla backed loan and replaces it with his pure cash dollars. Um, so that's that's interesting. Uh I don't know why necessarily that would bother Twitter, but we'll see. Musk remains personally responsible for $33.5 billion of the approximately $44 billion required to complete the transaction. Transaction. I guess what Twitter's likely to say here is that he has too much skin in the game, that he's he's breathing heavily uh, at this particular deal now. Musk grasps for an out. Musk wanted an escape, but the merger agreement left him little room. With no financing contingency or diligence condition, the agreement gave Musk no out absent a company material adverse effect or a material covenant breach by Twitter. Musk had to try to conjure one of these. I approve. So I approve the, the, story, the story that they tell is that May rolls around. He gets way too much skin in the game for his comfort level because of what was happening in the stock market. And then he starts to manufacture a breach of contract, which honestly, again, without us being able to know exactly how these interactions actually went, does match up with what we can see as happening in real time. Because what Elon Musk says in his letters is that he started asking for bot data in early May. And he asks letter after letter after letter after letter uh, through May, through June, uh, into that July termination period. Um, and so Twitter's telling us a story. Uh, and this is what they should do in their complaint document. But it does line up with the public facts that we know to be true as admitted uh, by Elon Musk. Now, he wouldn't say he's manufacturing this, obviously. Uh, but he does start to bang the drum for fake, false, or spam accounts at about that exact same time. What so Musk we read... alighted on? Wow, alighted. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've seen that word in a hot minute. They're using some rhetoric today. You know, I, I think I, Mark and I were talking about the fact Wachtel doesn't get to use this uh, novel prose uh, as often as they might otherwise like. So Twitter versus Elon Musk, they, go, they went nuts. It's written like a noir detective novel. Uh, what, what Musk alighted upon first was a representation in Twitter's quarterly SEC filings over many consecutive years that based on its internal processes, the company estimated the average of false or spam accounts on its platform represented fewer than 5% of our monetizable daily active users, which I will usually call active users for purposes of reading these things, mm -hmm. during the quarter. The MDAU is a non-GAAP metric, so it's not general accounting, because not everybody's gonna use it that way, mm -hmm. that Twitter employs to measure the number of people or organizations that use the Twitter platform. They are monetizable because we can serve them ads. They are real people that could click on things. In its filings, Twitter defines MDAU as people, organizations, or other accounts who logged in or were otherwise authenticated and accessed Twitter on any given day through Twitter.com, Twitter applications that are able to show ads, or paid Twitter products, including subscriptions. This is the number of people whose eyeballs we have that we can show ads to. Obviously, if that number is materially wrong, then their business model is materially out of whack. And so Elon Musk is going to start a campaign here to say 5%, nah. And that's what he does for the preceding two months. In addition to deploying automated and manual processes that suspend on average more than a million suspicious accounts each day, that's incredible, the company undertakes a rigorous daily process using human reviewers to estimate spam or false accounts remaining on its platform after automated filtering and manual review. A million accounts a day, does that sound right? That's a high number, isn't it? For, I don't know, maybe it's right. I mean, there's a lot of bots, so maybe. Suspending a million suspicious accounts each day. My God in heaven. Uh, okay. Um, so they're saying that they're doing what they should do to, to kill bots and get that number as accurate as they can. Twitter's SEC disclosures regarding that process and its findings are heavily qualified. And this is important. They don't actually guarantee this number in their documents, right? As described in the note regarding key metrics section of its filings, Twitter's calculation of its active users is not based on any standardized industry methodology. They have disclosed this publicly, and this is a pretty good shield for them. May differ from may differ from estimates published by third parties or from similarly titled metrics of our competitors, because other tech companies do use active users, and may not accurately reflect the actual number of people or organizations using our platform. Look at this one. Twitter says it may not accurately re reflect our users in their SMC disclosures. So when they say that this kind of thing can't be a company material adverse effect, it's stupid, but they might have an argument there. And it's an interesting one. 
As for the estimate of spam or false accounts as a percentage of active users, Twitter explains that it is based on an internal review of a sample of accounts involves significant judgment, may not accurately represent the actual number of false or spam accounts, and could be too low. That Twitter, part, I don't, the could be too low part is not actually in quote marks, I'll take that. It isn't quoted, is it? Mm. Twitter has published the same qualified estimate that fewer than 5% of its active users are spam or false for the last three years and published similar estimates for five years preceding that. Now, Which in no sense indicates that any of them were good at any point. Just because I said the same thing three years in a row doesn't mean it was true at any of those points. Right. And that's your primary issue here, right? So they've got some good language on their behalf that says it may not accurately reflect anything. Um, but you are allowed to assume that certain steps have been taken to check on that number and that it isn't as Elon Musk describes it in his letter to the SEC, wildly understated. Uh, he actually uses. The yeah, word I'm not going to let you state a number and then say, oh, by the way, this number doesn't mean anything. Could That's, be too low. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to let you get away with that bullshit. <laughs> if I'm interpreting this right. So I'm like, I, 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 I would interpret it. I would interpret to mean that it may not be hyper accurate and there's some margin of error, not that the number is not reflective of anything resembling reality. Yep. We don't know. We just like the number five mm. at the end of the day. Um, I do want to catch these super chats here. Mary Sunderland, love Hoglaw. Thank you. Just don't have any original questions. Thank you for all you do. That is very nice of you, Mary. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, Rifka Muhammad, he was dodged from the offset, dodgy from the offset. He should have declared passing the threshold of ownership in Twitter. Yes. Uh, usually at 5% and then at 10%, even if it's indirect. He doesn't own 10% yet. I think he's at 9.8 um, mm -hmm. right now. So he doesn't have a 10% disclosure, but yes. Um, he's going to wind up, I think, probably paying a penalty uh, to the SEC for the 5%. We'll see whether or not that happens. Obviously, there's a lot more going on now. Uh, but yes, Elon Musk, I don't know if I would describe it as dodgy, uh, but he's certainly all over the place. And if I were on the Twitter board while all this was happening, I would be very, very defensive uh, about him kind of rolling in and looking like Jack Sparrow doing whatever he wants, uh, trying to figure out whether he wants to be on the board or buy the company or start a competitor uh, and just buying up portions of my company for the heck of it or to troll us. Uh, so I think that there are reasons to be concerned there. But I agree with you, Kurt, that this language overall is good for them to say, look, our 5% doesn't mean anything, but it's also probably goes too far uh, mm -hmm. for good faith. And certainly I think the SEC would think so if it turned out that they had, oh, I don't know, 50% spam bots, and this is what they were going out with to the market. If we separate out completely from Elon Musk and an SEC independent investigation to determine that, they, they would have a problem. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Um, so Elon Musk saying you, you have a problem just based on the limited data that you've given me could be something, even though they're trying to say, well, we disclosed. What does he think the number is? He says wildly understated at 5%. He does not offer a number. Uh, it would be, that would be helpful to have that information right about now. He says he can't do it because they haven't given him the proper data, but even on whatever he says, it's like, even on the limited amount of data they have shown their number is wildly understated. Uh, what, does he have like sort of a minimum guess? I mean, because like, how does he know that he's in breach of their representations if he has no idea what the number is? Well, their breach is the information itself. So they owe him the information under that section 6.4. That's, that's a fair point. Carry on. They don't, they don't give it to him. And that's what he's declaring the breach. Fair enough. Then he also says, based on limited amounts of what I've seen, I think you're also in breach of your rep. Uh, and you're in breach of your rep for SEC filings. And so I also think that that's going to be a company adverse effect because the SEC is not going to be thrilled with you. Uh, and when the SEC comes down, that's going to be a bad day for you. Uh, Musk was well aware when he signed the merger agreement that spam accounted for it, some portion of Twitter. Isn't this the very meeting. SEC that he said he had no respect for the SEC? On yes. that interview with 60 Minutes, just just reminder, I have no respect for the SEC, that SEC. Okay, Elon, sorry. Elon Musk does not have a comitous relationship with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Okay, I'm just checking. Uh, <laughs> Spam was one of the main reasons Musk cited publicly and privately for wanting to buy the company. On April 9th, the day before, uh, the day Musk said he wanted to buy Twitter rather than join its board, he texted Taylor that purging fake users from the platform had to be done in the context of a private company because he believed it would make the numbers look terrible. At a public event on April 14th, Musk said eliminating spam bots would be a top priority for him in running Twitter. On April 21st, days before the deal was inked, he declared, if our Twitter bid succeeds, we will defeat the spam bots or die trying. I like this argument from Twitter. I especially like this. I texted to the board uh, that if we purged our fake users, it would make the numbers look terrible. So we have to do it privately. It's pretty good. It's pretty good, Twitter. Musk echoed that same se sentiment in the press release announcing the merger on April 25th, stating that upon acquiring Twitter, he would prioritize defeating the spam bots and authenticating all humans. Yet, 
Musk made his offer without seeking any representation from Twitter regarding its estimates of spam or false accounts. He even sweetened his offer to the Twitter board by expressly withdrawing his prior diligence condition. Now, this isn't a killer point for them, but it is the case that you could have written a representation that actually says you you promise that your bots are 7% or lower. I mean, whatever number you want to pick. He didn't do that. Now, I think a reasonable person could also say, yeah, because you disclose stuff in your SEC filings, he was allowed to rely on your public statements. You're a public company, for God's sake. Um, mm -hmm. And so you don't need that separate representation. But these are the kinds of things that a reasonable person could fight. Um, and yet I, I'm still kind of, uh, I'm, I'm taken with Twitter uh, saying that Elon Musk specifically tweeted them and said he, that he has to buy the company because it'll make the numbers look terrible. If that's actually an evidence, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. On May 5th, Musk announced that he had raised an additional $7.1 billion of equity commitments for the deal from 19 investors, including some big wigs. Musk investors, all sophisticated market participants, made these commitments in the face of Musk's public statements regarding spam accounts and knowing he had forsworn diligence. He didn't forswear diligence. Musk made his plans to address spam a key part of his pitch. As uh, Andresen Horowitz, co-CEO, stated in publicly announcing the investment, the firm thought Musk was perhaps the only person in the world who could fix Twitter's alleged difficult issue with bots. Everybody knew we had a bot problem. This is a very interesting complaint right now, right? Twitter's out there saying, everybody knows a platform is fake. Everybody knows that 5% don't mean anything. Elon Musk sure knew. All these sophisticated investors knew. And now you virtual legality watchers or listeners or replay crew members, you too know. And so that's not a great look for Twitter. They must think that they can really force this deal to happen because otherwise they're burning bridges left and right on this stuff. Apparently, someone had recently tweeted to me, apparently 28% of my followers are bots. I don't know where these bots are coming from or why they exist. <laughs> but according to some study, someone quoted, 28% of my followers are bots. I never know about those things. Like you put in, yeah. a, you put in a person's name yeah. and it pops out like what their bot followers are. I never know. I don't know, I, I, I don't know, know where these bots, bots are coming from, why they exist. Uh, yeah. Then, however, as the market declined, Musk's advisors began to demand detailed information about Twitter's methods of calculating uh, active users and estimating the prevalence of false or spam accounts. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. You just said he manufactured this issue. Uh, is, is paragraph 70 Twitter saying that Elon Musk had a legitimate issue with his investors? Musk's advisors began to demand? I guess he's, they're saying it's still Musk because of the market. Uh, so not not his investors advisors they're still putting this all on musk trying to manufacture something with the market um so false alarm there twitter had entered into a confidentiality agreement with musk to share non-public information in preparation for post-closing transition and convened an in-person meeting with musk and his team on may 6th among the topics of discussion were active users and spam related subjects in advance of the meeting musk's bankers circulated an agenda with items related to users on the twitter platform including how do you estimate that fewer than 5% of your active users are false or spam accounts? How, how do you know? Twitter's representatives addressed that question at the meeting, summarizing the company's process. I will guarantee you that there is a difference in position as to whether Twitter's representatives, quote unquote, address that question. Elon Musk has said time and time again that he is dissatisfied with what Twitter has told them about their process. So address that question, yes, in so far as they gave an answer. Uh, but I think that Elon Musk has continued to represent that he is unsatisfied with what he has been told about that process. Following up on or about May 9th, Musk's bankers at Morgan Stanley added entries to their diligence tracker requesting user-related information, including a request for, quote, user database containing key metrics, including but not limited to number of users, number of verified users, number of monthly active users, number of handles, etc. Neither Musk nor his advisors said what had prompted these requests or identified new information regarding sp spam or false accounts that had come to light warranting the inquiries. Nothing had changed about Twitter's estimates concerning the prevalence of spam on the platform in the days since citing. Nonetheless, in the spirit of cooperation, Twitter responded on May 12th with data sets and written descriptions of its audience metrics and its process for sampling the prevalence of false or spam accounts. Okay, I, I'm so confused right now because this, this paragraph seems so counter to their entire complaint because okay. their entire complaint, as I understood it, is basically he's requesting information that is not sufficiently related to the closing of the deal and yes, there's no reason for it okay so what he what they're saying what they seem to be telling me now is his bankers investors parties are wanting now representations regarding these key metrics these are the people that are apparently providing him financing 
and they was like, okay, so my financiers apparently, for whatever reason they want to, and their internal motivations be as they may, they now want that specific information. So they are my financiers. They're the ones that I'm using to, to consummate this deal. So they want it for whatever reason they want it. Okay, fine. So now I'm going to go get it so I can help satisfy my financiers and my backers. I go get them the information. And through some combination of the information that you reveal to me, you refused to reveal to me, didn't reveal to me, or I did reveal and told my backers and my backers reviewed and whatever, this is what's causing the deal to fall apart. So it seems like it kind of almost justifies itself. I request the information specifically because my backers wanted it. In order to consummate the deal, it's relevant to that. It was relevant to them. And because of the stuff you did slash didn't do, the entire deal and financing fell apart. So like, am I, is it just me or does this paragraph seem like something's wrong here? Well, so they did put above, and I don't remember whether you had joined the stream yet or not, that there is a very strong financing protection for Twitter, which I agree with in terms of their characterization, that basically says we don't have to create data for your financing. You promise that there aren't financing conditions and will only really help with the stuff that we otherwise already have in order to give you know the logistical information to your financing partners, but it's not supposed to be a big deal. Financing gets weird when the market turns. That's part of what Twitter's saying here. Um, and then I think you're right, Kurt, that it is interesting that at least when you start talking about Morgan Stanley, that isn't Musk directly. And every time they go into not Musk directly, I do think it lends credence to this is a legitimate issue as a concept, um, whether it's investors or, or direct financiers rather than manufactured. Um, so I don't think that that helps them here. But I think what they're going to wind up leaning on in this document is that all of this stuff from banks, from people that are otherwise supposed to have financing ready, that effectively doesn't count. That doesn't land in 6.4, that lands in 6.10, um, and we shouldn't have an issue there. Now, the other thing I do note in this paragraph is that their description of what they provided doesn't mm, entirely match up with the request, right? So they quote the request, they ask for a database here, and they say, mm -hmm. in the spirit of cooperation, which is designed to say, we didn't have an obligation to do it, right? It's designed to say, we didn't have to, under the agreement, give this information up, which they're sticking to their guns on that. They're setting you up for that. I don't know that that's in fact the case. They give data sets with written descriptions and a the process for sampling the false or spam accounts, which matches up largely with what Elon Musk has complained about, that they give him different information that is otherwise locked down or not be not capable of being analyzed in the way that he wants to analyze it. And here, Twitter kind of admits that. We gave them some form of this that didn't necessarily match up with exactly what they asked for. That's what I read here in the in the way these two. Well, did you together. keep providing them information? If not, what happened to that spirit of cooperation? Yeah, and, and, and at least as described by Elon Musk, he makes a number of different requests and he says that he tries to narrow them. Reasonable minds can differ on whether that is in fact the case, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe the market realized that your numbers were full of shit that they had filed publicly and uh, that what they thought everyone was buying was not really well, what it I, to be. We're on May 9th, so Elon's about to say the deal's on hold because that's when yeah. I pick it up again in virtual legality. So early on May 13th, 2022, in advance of a diligence meeting that had been scheduled to discuss the data Twitter had provided, Musk tweeted without any advance notice to the company that the Twitter deal is temporarily on hold until the company showed him proof for its estimate that less than 5% of Twitter accounts are spam or false, which is where I talk in this space about saying, well, there's no on hold provision. Uh, in a merger agreement. There's certainly nothing that permits him to do this other than to just slow ball things. Um, and so Twitter is rightly pointing out that this is the first bit of evidence uh, in public that Elon Musk is, is, is maybe playing games a little bit with this deal. The Reuters story Musk linked to in his tweet was a report on Twitter's 10Q filing made on May 2nd, 2022, and contained the same heavily qualified 5% estimate Twitter had been disclosing in its SEC filings for the past three years. In fact, I, I know something about how highly qualified, how heavily qualified 5% estimate just seems like such a such a burn. I understand what they're doing. They're yeah. trying to say like publicly, like we basically already said that our number is meaningless. But you now you're just, just basically the saying the quiet part out loud. Now you're just saying the quiet part out loud. Yeah, we've been full of shit and we've been telling you for years. Well, take the Who subtext your there. Take the subtext there if you're evaluating Twitter, right? You can't believe that 5%. Twitter is not out here in this document saying we stand by our 5%. They're, they're out here no, saying we never we, 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 We've heavily qualified that statement in our SEC filings. Guess what else we've heavily qualified that you're just now going to start noticing? Our SEC mm -hmm. filings are full of crap. You can't That's rely right. on anything. Yeah. We never, <laughs> ever stood behind that 5%. Okay. Sorry about that. Did it look like it? 
And of mm. course, SEC filings have ten. They though, they themselves mentioned that they had filed that like three years ongoing, and and apparently similar estimates for five years prior to that. So apparently, for eight years, they thought it was important enough to put in their filings, and for eight years, apparently they're full of shit. So right. Who's, remember, who, this is this is like a, this is a cell phone here. SEC rules are basically very amorphous. They're allowed mm -hmm. to come down on you for misleading uh, and you misleading think? by omission of detail. Um, and things like that. So when Elon Musk goes out there and says, I think an SEC storm is coming for you and your complaint says this, I'm not so sure he's we've wrong. Been we've been uh, lying to the SEC for years, man. And you yeah. should have known because our language was so heavily qualified, man. We You should know we were lying for years. A sophisticated party should be able to read that and understand that doesn't mean anything. Uh, right? I don't know, man. So, but you still have a wild card actor. This is like two, this is, this is two wild cards fighting each other here. Musk had no basis for asserting that the deal was on hold based on this longstanding disclosure. That's accurate. <laughs> Twitter's deal counsel called Musk's deal counsel two hours after the on hold tweet was published. Musk belatedly tweeted that he was still committed to the deal. Cognizant of its own obligations under the merger agreement, Twitter proceeded with the May 13th diligence meeting, which lasted for about two hours. Not the world's longest diligence meeting, by the way. During this session, Twitter explained, among other things, that its spam estimation process entails daily sampling for a total set of approximately 9,000 accounts per quarter that are manually reviewed. 9,000 per quarter? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> millions and millions and millions of accounts. You just said you suspend a million a day and you sample less than 10,000 per quarter. Now, statistics are magical. I'm not a mathematician. You can do a lot of things with a small sample set. Mm. I have no idea whether that is a sufficient amount to actually do. Hack, hack that p-value. Just keep hacking I, it. Right. Right. Again, I know enough to be dangerous on these mm. kinds of topics. So I will, I will leave that to my mathematical betters. But I will say at least from just the third party layman's in terms of this kind of thing perspective, that looks like a really small number of accounts. Later that day, Musk tweeted publicly a misrepresentation that Twitter's sample size for spam estimates was just 100. That's not what the text says. I can literally read it. You are mischaracterizing what he's writing. I can literally read. To find out, my team will do a random sample of 100 followers of Twitter. I that is not I him saying. He is not publicly misrepresenting that Twitter's sample size is 100. That is not what that says. He is well, saying that he is going to, to do a sample of, of 100. Tweet. That is we, two completely different statements. We got to get to the bottom. We got to get to the bottom of the second tweet. So he, he tweets okay, out he's going to do 100. He never says mind. something about 100. And then, and then he says, I picked 100 as the sample size number because that is what Twitter uses to okay, calculate. I retract my rage. Never mind. Sorry. Okay. My bad. All right. We got to read the whole tweet. We got to read the whole tweet. tweet uh, I don't have time for that. Okay. So, but I, but all right. So if it's, if it's 9,000, isn't 100 per day, 3,000 per month to get you to 9,000? Am I, am I doing that math wrong? I hate math. Isn't, isn't 9,000 per quarter, 100 per day? Am I wrong on this? Chat, help me on the math. Yes. Oh, you're right. Jason Kennedy with the win here. Yes, it is. Hang on, let me, let me drag him in. Thank you, Jason Kennedy. 9,000 per quarter is 100 per day. <laughs> yeah, so if you do 9,000 accounts per quarter and he says you do a sample size of 100 a day, he's right. So well, I, 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 re, I, re, I reinstate my rage. We, we don't know the methodology, but it's like, what, what are you talking about? If you say you do 9,000 per quarter, a quarter is 90, 90 days, days, give or take, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's... That's 100, that's 100 per day on average. I don't know how you actually test the thing, um, but yes. So it's a misrepresentation that the, the sample size for spam estimates was just 100. Um, strikes me that's 100 per day. But maybe maybe the per day doesn't come out here. Do a random sample. I picked 100 because that is what Twitter uses. Uh, so maybe it's a misrepresentation by omission. But for the team that's talking about heavily Please. qualified definitions, it's uh, all right. Please. <laughs> Uh, the next day, he boasted publicly that he had violated his non-disclosure obligations. Twitter legal just called to complain that I violated their NDA by revealing the bot check sample size is 100. That's this also not happened. the same thing. Now, what's what's interesting there? He's not he's, saying that he violated it. He's saying that you said you violated it, which is not the same thing. Uh, that is true. Kurt, that is an Thank excellent you. rhetorical argument. Uh, he says that Twitter complained, which is not an admission of guilt, certainly. No. Um, but either way, it's like, okay, if it's not 100, then is that a disclosure? This is also a good point, Richard. <laughs> Musk's tweets on May 13th and 14th violated his obligations under the merger agreement, including the provisions prohibiting public comments not consented to by Twitter, disparagement, misuse of information provided under Section 6.4, requiring best efforts to consummate the merger. Now, his his actual 
publication rules. I'm trying to pull up the folder here, but the uh, why is that qualified disparagement? If that's the, uh, it if, doesn't I mean, that, disparagement yeah. is undefined in this bad boy. Well, I mean, even hypothetically, it's like if that's the number, then it's not disparaging. That's just true. So in term, but in terms of public announcement, notwithstanding the foregoing, Elon's allowed to issue tweets about the merger or the transaction so long as they don't disparage the company. So it, it's okay. What's it mean to disparage the company? It's in the eye of the beholder, I suppose. Well, if it's a hundred and it's not true, it's I guess disparagement because it's a lie about the company. Um, but otherwise, it's he doesn't really say anything one way or the other about it being good or bad. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, but yes, I suppose if it's a lie. But nine thousand users per quarter certainly averages to a hundred per day. On May sixteenth, Agrawal tweeted that Twitter's five percent estimate is based on multiple human reviews in replicate for thousands of accounts that are sampled at random consistently over time from accounts we count as active users. He explained that the company's human review process uses both public and private data to make a determination on each account, something Twitter also explains in its SEC filings. Agrawal stood by Twitter's estimate and noted that the company is constantly updating its systems and rules to remove as much spam as possible. Yeah, they, this is when they got into a public Twitter fight about what it is that Twitter actually does. Musk responded with another <laughs> disparaging tweet, a poop emoji. Now, technically speaking, I'm not positive that's a disparaging tweet. He's saying that this argument is bad. I'm not positive that that's disparagement. It would be very interesting to see a full adjudication of the disparagement provision. Is of the poop emoji disparagement? Against the poop emoji. It seems like a we'll very have to, happy We'll have to get Patrick Stewart to give testimony. Yeah, well, look at how happy this poop emoji looks. Does that did look get, like did you get my joke? Poop emoji? Or is that too inside baseball? So no, no it's that okay. it's it's very funny. And Elon is like this, right? He's trolling on online. Uh, but if you're going to actually bring up a contractual breach for disparagement, I think you need more than a poop emoji. I really mm -hmm. do. Um, here, so anyway, as the market continued to fall, Musk persisted in his public and misleading attacks on Twitter's handling and disclosure of spam or false accounts. Interesting point here in terms of rhetoric. What we just talked about in those sections, that's going to affect the court, right? They're, they're saying that they prove that there is per, uh, persistent and misleading attacks on Twitter. And he certainly seems like a wild card. I don't know that he's attacking specifically uh, in those tweets, although it's certainly not the way that a normal uh, purchaser would act in respect of its target acquisition. In another tweet on May 15th, and a statement at a technology conference on May 16th, Musk made the baseless claim that fake users might account for as much as 90% of Twitter users. Asked whether the Twitter deal is going to get closed, Musk responded that it really doesn't depend on a lot of factors and posited that Twitter's estimate that spam or false accounts comprise fewer than 5% of active users might be a material adverse misstatement, which isn't a legal term, but it's a good try, if in fact it is four or five times that number or perhaps 10 times uh, that number. I'd like to take note even at 10 times that number, that is still uh, not 90%. It isn't 90 and they didn't quote 90. So I, I would be interested to see exactly how they got there. But may, maybe it's maybe it's later on uh, here. But yes, yeah, so Elon Musk is out there. He's not allowed to make public statements uh, about the deal at all. He is allowed to tweet about it as long as it's not disparaging. And, and I will admit, at bare minimum, he walks close to the line on a lot of this stuff, um, if not over the line, right? So it, it, when we look at that announcement, it's pretty broad, except as otherwise contemplated for things like counter offers from other parties. As long as the agreement is in effect, the company parent and acquisition shub shall consult with each other before issuing any press release or otherwise making a public statement with respect to this agreement or the transactions contemplated hereby, uh, right? So this agreement entails Twitter as an entity. So I would argue that anything that relates to Twitter's operational capacity or other information that he might have on the company falls under this umbrella. I would guess that Elon Musk's counter response is, no, no, I'm just talking about Twitter. I'm not talking about the purchase of Twitter. Uh, but um, I, I think he's walking real close to the line with this stuff, just regardless of its truthfulness, in terms of what he has otherwise signed up to not do. On May 17th, Musk tweeted without basis or explanation that 20% fake slash spam accounts while four times what Twitter claims could be much higher, adding that this deal cannot move forward pending further analysis of Twitter's spam estimates. In yet, in yet another breach of his non-disparagement obligation and efforts covenants, Musk encouraged the SEC to investigate the accuracy of Twitter's disclosures. Uh, Twitter claims that more than 95% of daily active users are real unique humans. Does anyone have that experience? A poll. And then Eva Fox, a apparent Twitter user, now in a giant lawsuit, the SEC should investigate whether the Twitter claims are true. Hello, SEC Gov, anyone home, says Elon Musk. 
So, um, I, I honestly think that he's probably violating his public announcement type stuff with this. Um, and, and I think he has, he's walked across that line a number of times. Twitter wants to get this deal done. They're not holding him in breach of these things. Um, but I think what they're going to wind up arguing is that his consistent breach of things like this prevents him from terminating really at all. Um, and then since he can't terminate that he is, uh, essentially recanted from his obligations and that Twitter can force them through the provisions that they have in their document. Um, I actually hadn't seen this one. Uh, so um, Elon Musk was out there um, uh, really acting against his target in a way that is unusual. Uh, defendants lawyer letters. You want to read some, Kurt? Sure. Even as Musk was violating his own contractual obligations, Twitter continued to respond cooperatively to his representatives' increasingly unreasonable inquiries. Between May the 16th and May the 20th, the company provided detailed written responses to several information requests. On May the 20th of 2022, Musk's team sent a request for Twitter's Firehose data, which is essentially a live feed of its data concerning activity, tweeting, retweeting, and liking tweets, for example, associated with public accounts on Twitter's platform. Again, no explanation was offered for how this request furthered a reasonable business purpose related to consummation of the transactions contemplated by the merger, as required by Section 6.4. Nor can the firehose data even be used to accurately estimate the prevalence of spam or false accounts. Okay. As Agrawal had explained in May the 16th tweets, that estimate depends in part on private data not available in the firehose. Conversely, the firehose includes tweets that Twitter systems and processes catch and do not count within the daily users for the day. On May the 20th. Hang on. So that's interesting in and of itself, right? So he asks for Twitter's full pipeline of info. And apparently Twitter responds, or at least claims in this complaint document, that he can't use that to figure out what spam or bots are. And I think my answer to that is he can't use Twitter's methodology to do that. But certainly there have to be ways to just evaluate tweets or other interactions and use some kind of analytics to try to determine whether or not something is artificial just based on the superficial, yeah. right? Like it might not be sending, as effective as I'm all else. sending the exact same message might be a clue, for example. Yeah, thousands and thousands of identical messages at once in one you know, batch uh, would presumably be an instance where you could at least identify that uh, through that information. So like so many instances in documents, this one rings at least a little bit false, which is like it has to be of some use to get all the activity on the platform, right? Yeah, I, I think. think. On May the 21st of 2022, Twitter hosted a third diligence session with Musk's team and again discussed Twitter's process for calculating the daily users and estimates of spam or fake accounts. Twitter also provided a detailed summary describing the process the company uses to estimate spam as a percentage of daily users. Defendants responded with increasingly invasive and unreasonable requests. Yeah, and I knew rather this was than coming. use yeah, I guess. And rather than use reasonable best efforts to minimize any disruption to the respective business of company and its subsidiaries that may result from requests for access, defendants repeatedly demanded immediate responses to their access inquiries. The scope of the requests and deadlines defendants imposed on their satisfaction were unreasonable, disruptive to the business, and far outside the bounds of Section 6.4. This is the crux. Paragraph 85, tell your friends, this is where Twitter's main defense lives, right? We've talked about a lot of a lot of other defenses that could hold water, him being in breach of his uh, announcement provision, all these kinds of things that we've otherwise talked about in this space. But the full on fight between Elon Musk and Twitter is whether or not Elon Musk has the right to receive the information that he has claimed he has the right to receive. And Twitter has now advanced. It's what I would argue is its main defense that what Elon Musk asked for was not reasonable that it was invasive, it did not protect the business operations of Twitter, and that they had no obligation to provide it, which we expected in the last two videos. You can go check, check the tape. We expected for them to say if they went this far, which was that Elon says they're reasonable, they're necessary, it's, an, it's needed to consummate the transaction, and they say it has nothing to do with consummating the transaction, and they became invasive, unreasonable, disruptive, all of this right here is where their main argument lies. And it's the one that if Elon Musk is going to prevail in all this, that they're going to have to defuse the best. Sorry. No worries. 
Twitter nonetheless continues to work with Musk to try to respond to the requests. It extended an ongoing offer to engage with Musk and his representatives regarding calculations of daily users, and in several more diligent sessions throughout the end of May. It also provided written responses, including custom reporting, to his escalating requests for information. Right. Right. And, yeah, it's it's exactly what we would expect. And, and here is where Twitter's uh, best argument comes in, which says, look, he continues to change his requests. Elon Musk has admitted that in the letters he sent to the SEC, and we keep trying to fulfill them. Mm-hmm. Look, we want the $54, all right? We've seen the market. <laughs> I bet you do want the $54. We want the $54. How about $25? Is $25 good for you? We're doing our best, and he keeps asking for more and more stuff. Um, and so Twitter says, we can only do what we can do. And one of the things that was interesting in the letter that he put forth to the SEC was he said, you know, they're on notice that they're in breach. Uh, as of a month ago, that gives me the right to terminate. But also in the intervening month, we've made more requests and they've given us certain bits of information that we were dissatisfied with, but that Twitter was clearly providing something. Um, and so whether or not they're acting in good faith or Elon Musk is, or the vice versa of either of those positions is what this case ultimately turns on in my in my estimation. There's a lot of other stuff. There's a lot of other bells and whistles that could potentially turn the case in one direction or another. But where this really lies as an argument is what was requested? Was it reasonable? What did Twitter do in response to those things? And what did that actually look like on the ground? Are we making a trip to Delaware? Or are we are we going to go uh, see this thing? What it all the court of Chantry? Yeah. I don't even know if it's public. <laughs> a private court, you say? Uh, <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll take a trip to, to the bright, sun, sunny shores of Delaware. Um, to, to, to go see this in action. Uh, they, they, they try to comply with his request. On May 25th, defendants counsel sent the first of a series of aggressive letters copying their litigation counsel at Quib Emanuel. That's when you really raise the stakes. Copied is my litigation team. This one falsely asserted that Twitter had failed to respond to any of defendants' information requests and insisted that defendants be granted access to the firehose data so Musk could make an independent assessment of the prevalence of fake or spam accounts on Twitter's platform. Though the letter called Twitter's own spam detection methodologies lax, it identified no basis for that. I mean, with this, with respect, your own description of your own sp- spam methodology seem a little bit lax. I mean, in terms of like, we reviewed 9,000 accounts a quarter. Ooh. We look at some personal stuff. We do some samples. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with somebody finding uh, that they think it is lax. Mm-hmm. Um, but and in terms of this, they they falsely asserted that they failed to respond to any. Yes, in terms of them handing over some amount of information, but if they didn't respond directly to the request, which even in their own description, it sounds like they didn't do, at least not note for note, then you could still say that they didn't respond. It's right. It's non-responsive to answer a different question. It's non-responsive to give a PDF version of something that should have been a database or whatever that happens uh, in these particular instances. So yeah, obviously Elon's escalating things by the time you bring in freaking Quinn Emanuel on the CC chain. Uh, but you know, I, I don't blame Twitter. That's why I always CC Hoag Law in all my letters. Oh, yes. I'm very intimidating. I'm very intimidating. At least, Taylor, thank you so much for the generous super chat. Love catching you in real time and with Uncivil. Cowboy hat emoji, orange heart emoji, or is that burnt orange heart emoji? New favorite LawTube duo. Thank you, Elise. I really appreciate you popping in in the super chat. Thank you so much. Um, and so that's where we're at with this, is that is that Twitter, I think they make some good points, but they 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 extend a little bit too far. Um, in terms of defending their position. All right. Nor I'm going to sign off for now. And uh, I'm going to cover this later on my own channel as well. But I just want to hang out with you for a little while. Sounds good, Kurt. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Yeah. Nor again did defendants explain how fulfillment of the firehose data demand would further consummation of the merger or what basis they had to demand the right to make an independent assessment of the prevalence of false or spam accounts on the platform. Even assuming that was a proper purpose, reviewing the full firehose data would not result in an accurate assessment of or mimic the rigorous process that Twitter employs. I don't think Elon Musk wants to mimic the rigorous process that Twitter employs. If we give him the benefit of the doubt, he thinks their process sucks. And so he wants to do a different process. So you continuing to say he wouldn't be able to figure it out in the way that we figure it out isn't terribly dispositive to my understanding of what's happening here. Well, would not result in an accurate assessment or mimic the rigorous process that Twitter employs by sampling accounts and using public and private data to manually determine whether an account constitutes spam, as Twitter's representatives had already repeatedly explained to Musk's team, which sounds a little bit paternalistic. I, again, I don't know what Elon Musk is doing here. I don't know whether he's trying to manufacture a reason that he can call them in breach. But certainly, if we imagine a situation in which Twitter talks to us and we say, that that method is stupid, 
I would like to engage in my own method, then them saying, well, that's if we give us you this data, then you can't use our method is just me reiterating the fact that I think your method is stupid. Uh, so I don't think that gets them out of this particular issue if that is, in fact, what is happening here. Obviously, you could think Elon Musk is just banking things up, and certainly that's what Twitter is advancing. On May 27th, Twitter responded by noting its weeks-long active engagement with Musk's team and explaining that some of defendants' requests sought disclosure of highly sensitive information and data that would be difficult to furnish and would expose Twitter to competitive harm if shared. After all, Musk had said he would do one of three things with Twitter, sit on its board, buy it, or build a competitor. He had already accepted and then rejected the first option and was plotting a pretextual escape from the second. Pretextual. Again, dirty liar, Your Honor. Musk's third option, building a competitor to Twitter, remained. Still, Twitter again responded constructively and reiterated its commitment to work with Musk's team to provide reasonable access to requested information. So we start to see between the lines a little bit of what's happening at Twitter HQ. They think at this point in time, at least described in this detailing of facts, that he's going to walk away, that he's trying to walk away. A pretextual escape from the deal is what he's trying to do and that he's going to build a Twitter competitor. That's where, when we look at these provisions, this section that says we don't have to give it to you if we think it would cause us significant competitive harm if the deal isn't consummated, comes into play. And that's what I would expect them to lean on as we push forward. On May 31st, defendants lobbed another missive, long letter, again falsely asserting that Twitter had refused to provide requested data and that the company's spam or false account detection methods were inadequate. The letter claimed Musk was willing to implement protocols to protect against damage or competitive harm to the company, sign up to NDAs, whatever else the company might require. On June 1st, Twitter responded by refuting that it had refused provision of data, demonstrating that to the contrary, it had been working with Musk's team to honor their requests within the bounds of the contract. To help set the protocols Musk had said he was willing to honor, Twitter asked a series of questions directed at how the data would be used and by whom and how it would be protected. So they're jousting here, right? June 1st rolls around. Twitter responds by saying, no, no, we've handed over some data with this other stuff that you have asked. What are you doing with it? Why are you looking at it? And how are you going to make sure that it isn't otherwise compromised? Data uh, defendant's response on June 6th uh, made no effort to answer those questions or identify data protection protocols. Instead, it accused Twitter of breach and advanced a false narrative that Twitter had been stonewalling Musk's requests. This is the letter that we saw. This is the letter that gets filed with the SEC saying that Twitter is in breach. Musk publicly filed the letter, which repeated his baseless and damaging charge that Twitter had lax detection methods. He included none of Twitter's correspondence in that filing and omitted all details about the information Twitter had provided. He thus continued to present the public with a misleadingly incomplete narrative about his communications with Twitter with equally misleading implications about the likelihood that the merger would be completed and about Twitter's operations. So he filed it with the SEC when he really didn't necessarily have to. He didn't include any of the things that we shared, and he's doing this as a kind of PR campaign to make us look bad. That's what Twitter is advancing right here. Steadfast in its commitment to consummate the merger, steadfast, Twitter continued to try to get Musk's team what it demanded while safeguarding its customers' data and harboring very real concerns about how Musk might use the data if he succeeded in escaping the deal. On or about June 9th, Musk counsel indicated that granting access to 30 days worth of historical firehose data would satisfy Musk's request. So on June 15th, the company gave Musk's team secure access to that raw data about 49 TB bytes worth. I don't know. I know terabytes. That's as high as I go. How high is a TB byte, computer science folks? Uh, is that like multiples of terabytes? It seems like a lot. I would guess that 49 TB bytes of all data Twitter has for a month, probably a pretty significant data sum. It did so even though the merger agreement did not require the sharing of this information. So as I mentioned, this June 6th letter is what Elon Musk is using as his notice of breach. And one of the complicating factors that he has with respect to this case is that he continued to ask for things from Twitter after that, and it looks like Twitter actually responded to some of it. He says, Musk's counsel indicated that 30 days worth of historical firehose data would satisfy Musk's request. If they actually have this, it's a little unusual that it's not quoted here, I suppose. If they actually have this, then that would be the kind of thing I would look to to say, well, if that's the case, then your 30-day countdown for breach followed by termination probably stopped when counsel says, if you give us this information, we'll be fine and then you hand over that information. So that's important because they're only allowed to terminate if there's a breach and it lasts for 30 days after that breach has been notified of uncured. And this would seem to be a curing action if a breach exists at all. 
It did so even though the merger agreement did not require the sharing of this information. Reasonable minds can differ as to whether 6.4 requires that information or not. Musk's next letter, dated June 17, skimmed over this massive data production. Like the earlier correspondence, the June 17 letter described an alternative reality in which Twitter had failed to cooperate in supplying Musk with information entirely contrary to the facts, apparently in the belief that repeating a falsehood enough can make it true. This is some dirty rhetoric here, right? The letter also continued to move the goalposts by adding a new request for the sample set and calculations Twitter used to estimate that fewer than 5% of its monetized active users are false or spam accounts over the past eight quarters. Thus, with no basis, defendants sought to audit information Twitter consistently had caveated as an estimate requiring significant judgment to prepare. So here they're saying Musk keeps changing what he's asking for. And ultimately, he's going to use June 6th to say that we've been in breach this whole time. He is not acting in good faith court. The June 17 letter further contained a litigation style discovery demand for information Musk asserted was needed to investigate the truthfulness of Twitter's representations to date regarding its active user base and the veracity of its methodologies for determining that user base. It broadly demanded board materials relating to monetized active users and spam, as well as emails, text messages, and other communications about those topics. In fact, we saw the list of things that he requested when he filed for his termination earlier uh, this week. Highly unusual requests in the context of good faith efforts towards completion of any merger transaction and absurd in the context of this one, which has no diligence condition. Musk propounded these unreasonable requests and touted his contrived narrative about Twitter's methodologies all without ever identifying a basis for questioning the veracity of Twitter's methodologies or the accuracy of its SEC disclosures. He never explained to us why he was concerned about these things. I'm not sure that's a requirement of his, honestly. It has to be in furtherance of the transaction, but I'm not sure that getting solid with the company I'm about to buy isn't overall related to the consummation of the transaction. On June 20, Twitter set the record straight in a detailed response letter. It noted that the two sides had been working collaboratively to clear regulatory hurdles and address voluminous data requests from defendants, that Twitter had dedicated significant resources to providing defendants with data requested, and that Twitter had already provided a wealth of data sweeping far beyond the bounds of what might conceivably be deemed reasonably necessary to consummate the transaction. We've already turned over way more information than we should have. Twitter noted that Musk, while continuing to accuse Twitter of misrepresenting its spam or false account estimate, had offered not a single fact to support the accusation. And Twitter observed that defendants' increasingly irrelevant, unsupportable, and voluminous information requests appeared directed not at consummated the merger, but rather the opposite, trying to avoid the merger, which is exactly how we framed the question in our earlier video in this playlist. And that was anticipated to be Twitter's argument. Way too much information requests. They don't relate to consummation of the transaction. They relate to trying to find an out for the transaction. And none of this should be supported by you, your honor, in the Delaware Court of Chancery. Nonetheless, in a continuing effort at cooperation, Twitter agreed to provide Musk everything he now demanded regarding the fire hose, including access to 100% of tweets and favoriting activity. Twitter cautioned, as it had so many times before, that this data would not allow Musk to accurately assess the number of spam or false accounts. But on June 21, it gave defendants counsel the demanded access. Meanwhile, Agrawal and Twitter CFO Ned Siegel had been trying to set up a meeting with Musk to discuss the company's process in estimating the prevalence of spam or false accounts. What's their method? On June 17, Siegel proposed a discussion with Musk and his team to cover spam as a percentage of DAU. Musk responded that he had a conflict at the proposed time. When Agrawal sought to re-engage on the matter, Musk agreed to a time on June 21, but then bowed out and asked Agrawal and Siegel to speak with his team not about the spam estimation process, but the pro forma financials for the data, completely separate question. On June 29, Musk complained through counsel that Twitter purportedly had placed an artificial cap on the number of searches Musk's experts could run on the fire hose data and had failed to respond to certain of the new requests made on June 17. We saw this reiterated in his termination letter. False again, as explained below, says Twitter. The June 29 letter notably did not take issue with Twitter's refusal to provide responses to the discovery-like requests for emails, text messages, and other communications in the June 17 letter, but it contained a slew of new demands, several asking Twitter to create more custom reporting. On July 1st, Twitter pointed out just how far beyond the scope of Section 6.4 defendants' requests had strayed. Nonetheless, Twitter noted that it was providing yet more information in response to recent requests and would continue to devote the time and considerable resources necessary to respond to outstanding requests. 
Twitter also explained that it had placed no artificial throttling of rate limits. In follow-up correspondence, it became clear that the limit Musk had bumped up against was not the result of throttling, but a default 100,000 per month limit on the number of queries that could be conducted. With his undisclosed team of data reviewers working behind the scenes, Musk had hit that limit within about two weeks. Twitter immediately agreed to and did raise the monthly search query limit 100-fold to 10 million, more than 100 times what most paying Twitter customers would get. Now, we've got some things happening here, which I think Twitter's telling a good story here that they were trying to comply with these information requests. He keeps changing them. They keep trying to comply, at least as presented in this complaint document. I think their narrative is strong. At least what Elon Musk has said in his letter is that it took them a week to change this quote unquote limit. And also here, it's worth noting that the acquirer of your company is probably not someone that you want to compare to even your biggest customers. He's not a customer of Twitter when he's talking about these things. You don't have to like it uh, in that he wants this information. But if you're otherwise acceding to his request, which you are doing by giving him this quote unquote fire hose data, then it doesn't make a lot of sense for him to have even any limit remotely close to what a quote unquote customer would have. He should have access the same as the company would have in order to evaluate what the company is. Uh, so I think Twitter's telling a good story here. I'm actually pretty compelled by what they're putting forth in these paragraphs, but I don't think it's fair or really rhetorically reasonable to say, oh, it's more than 100 times what a customer would get. That doesn't, that doesn't wash. From the outset of this extraordinary post-signing information exchange process, Musk accused Twitter of lax methodologies for calculating spam or false accounts. Knowing that his actions risked harm to Twitter and its stockholders, wreaked havoc on the trading price of Twitter's stock, and could have serious consequences for the deal, Musk leveled serious charges, both publicly and through lawyer letters, that Twitter had misled its investors and customers. So Musk, they say, starts threatening them internally that this is what's happening. But Musk exhibited little interest in understanding Twitter's process for estimating spam accounts that went into the company's disclosures. Indeed, in a June 30th conversation with Siegel, Musk acknowledged he had not read the detailed summary of Twitter's sampling process provided back in May. Once again, Siegel offered to spend time with Musk and review the detailed summary of Twitter's sampling process as the Twitter team had done with Musk's advisors. That meeting never occurred despite multiple attempts by Twitter. Now, there's two things happening here, both of which are interesting. And again, it comes down to who you believe on this kind of thing. Twitter is trying to establish that for somebody that claims to care so much about fake and bots and data and all this kind of stuff, Elon Musk, they continue to ask to talk to directly and he refuses. Now, that could be something that looks very bad. It is described here to look very bad uh, to the court. However, when they say, hey, we already talked to this uh, about this with your advisors, you could say, hey, I am the executive that delegates to my advisors. I trust what they have to say. I'm not so interested in the details myself. And that wouldn't necessarily make you wrong. It wouldn't necessarily obliterate your position that this is something that you deeply care about, even though it would certainly be better if you're in Elon Musk's shoes to not have these paragraphs describing the number of times that you didn't have this meeting. From the outset, defendants' information requests were designed to try to tank the deal. Musk's increasingly outlandish requests reflect not a genuine examination of Twitter's processes, but a litigation-driven campaign to try to create a record of non-cooperation on Twitter's part. When Twitter nonetheless bent over backwards to address the increasingly burdensome requests, Musk resorted to false assertions that it had not. So this is the primary complaint, as I said, starting in paragraph 85, finishing up here in the hundreds, that Twitter has. He manufactured a breach. He started asking more and more unreasonable things out of their information. And yet Twitter went forward and tried to comply with them as best they could. So he has no leg to stand on, Your Honor, because we complied with everything. And then even though we complied with everything at the end of the day, he still terminated on a 30-day window that had multiple information disclosures after it. Uh, and so we shouldn't be held in breach. On the financial information side, in seeking to manufacture a record of covenant breach, Musk seized not just on Section 6.4, but also on Section 6.11, which obligates Twitter to reasonably cooperate with parent to facilitate arrangement of a debt financing. Throughout the post-signing period, Twitter's advisors had been working with Musk's representatives to furnish them relevant financial information about the company. These discussions had been productive under the supervision on Musk's side of Bob Swan, a respected Silicon Valley financial professional and former CEO of Intel Corporation. Swan had been in regular contact with Siegel and had been leading defendants' purported effort to consummate the debt financing. Then, in that June 17 lawyer letter, Musk demanded a collection of financial information he claimed was necessary to better understand the state of Twitter's business and outlook, which is related to his acquisition plans and his financing for the transaction. 
He demanded a working bottoms-up financial model for 2022, budget plans with underlying modeling, and a working copy of Goldman Sachs valuation model underlying its fairness opinion. This demand is extremely unusual in merger transactions, and neither in conveying the demand nor at any time since have defendants pointed to a request from any lender that would justify it. Notably, Musk's debt financing commitments are not conditioned on receipt of any financial information about Twitter other than that contained in its quarterly SEC financing uh, filings. So what they're saying here, right, is that, yes, we have an obligation under Section 611 to give information that your partners might require in order to make the debt financing work. But they say that this is unusual. They've never seen this requested. I don't know that I have seen like requests for a valuation model, a working copy of it for its fairness opinion. I don't know that I've seen that, but I'm not working in these spaces very often. Uh, but what is more important from Twitter's argument side of things is that they say, hey, the banks didn't ask for this. You're asking for this. And so that automatically kind of falls outside of 611 in and of itself. Uh, what else do we have here? I have a question from Eitan Guynerd. Can you recap the earlier points this filing made about due diligence being waived real quick? Seems like Twitter has a strong case if that was truly waived and a weak one if not. So yes, he files with the SEC. He says there's not a financing condition to signing the merger agreement. Twitter thinks that that is quote unquote, for swearing all diligence. Twitter's wrong on that. The information do, uh, provision actually does provide for him to request information related to consummating the transaction. Anything related to that transaction, uh, we can pull that back up. Uh, but it is very broad. Any reasonable business purpose related to the consummation of the transaction is a very broad description. It's not as clear as the internet would like it to be. Twitter doesn't have a terrible argument to say, hey, we didn't have a pre-closing diligence process. Something was at least limited, if not waived, which is what the internet wants to say. And Elon Musk says 6.4 is effectively a full diligence provision when we don't think it should be. It's written very broadly. This is the kind of thing the court of chancery is going to have to determine uh, in all honesty. Uh, so that's where we sit here. I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer there. I'm giving you the, the full on lawyer. It depends. But the basics are it's not black and white. I can tell you Elon Musk did not forswear all diligence. He didn't waive any possibility of examining the company. But it is possible that he went outside the bounds of what 6.4 would otherwise allow him. That's certainly what Twitter is accusing him of. I hope that is helpful as an answer. Around the same time as the request on June 21, 2022, Musk falsely represented in a Bloomberg interview that an item requiring resolution before the transaction can complete is, will the debt portion of the round come together? As Musk well knew, financing expressly is not a condition to closing under the agreement. Still, intent on facilitating the merger's consummation, Twitter provided Musk with significant supporting detail for its proxy case projections, shared some of its financial plans, and gave him a copy of its banker's final presentation to Twitter's board. Section Seven. Let's take a pause here for just a second. Since I've been talking a lot, we're on page 45 of 62. We're in the end game now, folks. People are appearing in portals left and right of us, uh, and we're about to see what their one cause of action is. In a rarity, we don't have causes of action in this document. We have a cause of action, which honestly, I appreciate the focus uh, in only putting forth a single cause of action, which, by the way, is breach of contract. We'll get there. Uh, but you're seeing all of what they're laying out to get to that breach of contract uh, complaint. What do you all think? As I take a pause uh, for my voice a little bit here, uh, $44 billion acquisition needs a proper valuation. Sure. Um, uh, I tend good nerd. I'm sure there's a better way to pronounce that. That's perfect. Glad. I'm happy to have helped. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, Rich Codes Web, in my humble opinion, there is no such thing as an unreasonable request from someone who is trying to buy the business, especially when trying to confirm publicly stated, even if scoped and claimed vague, info. <clears throat> I tend to agree that there should be a great deal of leeway given in this particular type of transaction, especially with that broad language for, I need to be able to determine these things, right? S they say all of these provisions were negotiated and are in there for a reason. Section 6.4 is in there for a reason. The company shall give parent information that is reasonably requested for any reasonable business purpose related to the consummation of the transactions. Related to. The, the consummation of the transaction doesn't have to be dependent on it. It's anything related to that. Now, can you go too far with that? Of course you can. Any provision in a contract you can go too far with. That's why good faith and fair dealing are kind of these common law standardized principles. You can't just abuse what's in black and white in a document because you could always do that. There is no way to prevent a motivated party 
from cheating on a document with words on a page. So what we do is we impose this rule that says, regardless of what's said, you still have to follow within the bounds of the spirit of the deal. So could Twitter have a point that says, this was never intended here. This was not a meeting of the minds. And even if it were intended, we tried to meet him every time. Now they could argue with that. I expect that the response will argue with that. And we'll say, hey, Twitter wasn't responsive to this stuff at all. They want you to believe that they were. These were reasonable requests. And if it came down to it, we'd have an expert testifying to why these requests were reasonable in this context. And then that would have to be evaluated separately. Uh, but yes, I think that in general, when you're buying a company, it's in general the case that the buyer should have pretty broad authority to go in and check on the company's bank balances or finances, or in this case, their bots uh, that otherwise work on their platform. Uh, what else do we have here? We have a pronunciation, ng nerd. Oh, all right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Julie five four three. Yep. Take the word engineer, turn it into engineer, then add the letters it in front of it. It engineer. All right. I'm working on that one. Thank you so much uh, for the question. Uh, Rich Codes Web. I would be wondering why would Twitter think that he's going to start his own version of Twitter when he's agreed to purchase. Uh, they, they're clearly in kind of a defensive stance throughout this entire deal. I can't say that that's wrong. Uh, looking at the relationship that they had with Elon Musk, and it's been a very tumultuous year for them. And clearly, I think he was taking advantage of what he felt was a weakly positioned management team at the company. Uh, but otherwise, I agree with you. Once they've signed that deal, once it is a done deal, it's weird to have that provision that says we won't share information with you if it could be used against us if it falls apart, because it does indicate you have very little faith that this transaction is actually going to go forward as planned. Um, uh, Unowen was holo. Musk's practical heckling from the sidelines or perhaps in the arena himself on Twitter is bad optics, in my opinion. I agree. Though I'm sure the people who are supposed to love it do. Yeah, his trolling, that kind of stuff, I think hurts him in this particular context. Uh, and I think that um, he would be in a stronger position if he hadn't done those things. But that's who he is. He's this kind of internet troll for these various things, including today. Uh, with his ironic LOL. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, Ace Moonshot, Emily Baker has mentioned a throat spray that she uses. Actors use it, et cetera. Sorry, I cannot recall the name. You should ask her. It will help you a lot, I think. You mean when I when I do three hours straight of talking? Uh, yeah, I, I can definitely ask about that. I have in the past used numbing agent on my throat, but I don't know that that's a terribly healthy uh, thing to do uh, when you have these big, long talks. But, yeah, I, uh, I love... I love having these conversations with y'all. I love reading these documents. I'm going to continue to do so. We just got to make sure it works. Um, and certainly uh, co-counsel bringing in a bottle of water uh, was absolutely perfect uh, for this particular stream. And I'm so glad that she did. Uh, tea doesn't help. Sometimes it helps. Depends. It works for me in the morning. Stick with water. Fair enough. All right. Let's get back to the document. Thank you, everybody, for the chatting. I just wanted to make sure we had a little brief pause here before we headed into section seven. Defendants materially breach their obligations to work towards closing and refrain from unreasonable withholding of consent to operational changes. Consummating a merger agreement involves substantial effort and requires a serious deployment of resources by the seller. Absolutely true. Defendants thus are subject to contractual obligations requiring them to take actions necessary to close and to allow Twitter to operate as efficiently as possible in the interim. Defendants violated two important obligations of this kind the duty to work towards finalizing the financing for the closing, and the obligation to consider consents reasonably. First, defendants abandon financing-related efforts in breach of Section 610. Musk's distortive public statements about the deal and his increasingly aggressive information demands through counsel raised Twitter's suspicion that he was secretly abandoning efforts to finalize the committed debt financing in time for a prompt closing. Section 610 requires defendants to take all steps necessary to secure the already committed financing for the closing. Twitter's concern deepened when, on June 23rd, Musk texted Twitter's management to say that he had asked Swan to depart the deal proceedings as we are not on the same wavelength. At the same time, Musk said he was trying to prepare the cash flow projections necessary to secure the debt and asked for Twitter's cash flow projections over the next three years and a comparison of historical projections to actuals to assist debt issuers who are much more conservative than equity investors. Customarily, projections are needed well in advance of closing and before approaching ratings agencies, which is a key step in consummating debt financing. They are the buyer's and not the seller's responsibility. 
Although if the buyer needs help with these kinds of things, generally the seller uh, wants to do that for them because they want to sell the company. Over the ensuing days, Twitter's repeated requests for a contact in lieu of Swan generated no response. Outreach by Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan to Morgan Stanley likewise was met with silence. Yeah, they were stonewalling him. Faced with this uncertainty and with Musk's insinuations about his lenders on June 28th and again on July 6th, Twitter exercised its rights under Section 610 of the merger agreement to formally seek information about the status of Musk's financing. Defendants still have provided no substantive response. Instead, the day after the first of these requests, Musk warned Agrawal and Siegel to back off. Your lawyers are using these conversations to cause trouble. That needs to stop in text form from Elon Musk. On June 30, Musk informed Siegel that replacement team member and longtime Musk confidant Antonio Gracias would be taking over the financing effort that Swan had helmed, but Gracias never appeared. This is stuff that we haven't seen uh, in public, right? We haven't seen what had been happening with this financing option here. Uh, and I think this is important because what Twitter is trying to frame as having had happened here is that Elon Musk lost his appetite for this deal sometime in May. Uh, as they put it, with the market having a downturn. And so what they are saying here is that he cancels his debt financing that he promised to have lined up, that he really did have lined up in terms of documentation that presumably Twitter checked uh, at the time. And we saw as filed uh, in the merger documentation, we saw when this deal was first signed uh, in its entirety. And he got rid of some of those aspects. And then he says he needs more information to get more debt financing. And Twitter starts to think that he's playing around. Um, and in connection with everything that he's asking for, for more and more data, they have started to paint a picture that I do find compelling, uh, which I don't know the facts of, but if we assume that what Twitter is saying is accurate, which we have to because it's the only document we have to look at, is of a person that is trying to back out of a deal without owing the billion dollar guarantee and without owing the $44 billion to actually pay for what is now potentially an overpriced set of assets in the company that he's going to have to burn more of what is his primary asset kind of portfolio with Tesla stock. Uh, and they've presented a picture that I can buy that Elon Musk got cold feet and then was doing everything within his legal power, or at least legal power up through the termination of the agreement uh, to make things slow down. Uh, and Twitter is pointing out that they don't like that. Musk delays and stymies key operational decisions. Since signing, Twitter has complied in all respects with its obligation under 6.1 of the merger agreement to operate the business in the ordinary course. In an excess of caution, the company has sought Musk's consent even for matters falling well within the zone of commercial reasonableness. Though Musk has approved some of Twitter's requests, he has been slow to respond to ones that required urgency and has unreasonably withheld his consent to others in breach of his own obligations under section 6.1. Now, this is a raw legal assertion, but in general, when you agree that your consent will not be unreasonably withheld, for the most part, that means you're going to give the consent. Most notably, Musk has unreasonably withheld consent to two employee retention programs designed to keep selected top talent during a period of intense uncertainty generated in large part by Musk's erratic conduct and public disparagement of the company and its personnel. Now, that's interesting because Twitter says it's because of you that we need this retention bonus pool and Musk has refused to consent to it because they said it's because of you. During negotiation of the merger agreement, Twitter had sought Musk's consent to a broad retention plan. Musk's team deferred decision on the matter. The plan Twitter proposed was detailed. The time for negotiation was short, but Musk indicated he was open to further discussion. During a May 6 post-signing diligence session, Twitter management again broached the subject of that retention and Musk was non-committal. He suggested the matter be tabled pending further clarity on the expected interval before closing the deal. Now, retention is a deal kind of concept. It is entirely outside of the ordinary course, provided that it's related to Musk coming in and becoming the owner of the company. Now, Twitter says this has gotten so crazy. They don't like Elon Musk. We saw all those reports and outlets because in order to keep them at all, we're going to have to put some money on the line. Elon Musk is reluctant to do so as of May 6th. Over the weeks that followed, Swan discussed with Twitter management a narrower retention plan than the one that had been discussed during the merger agreement negotiations. Consistent with those discussions on June 20, Twitter sent defendants a formal request for consent to two tailored employee retention programs that had been vetted by the board and its compensation committee with the assistance of an outside compensation consultant. Musk, Musk initially failed to respond at all to the June 20 consent request. It would soon become clear that he had fired Swan, with presumably they were communicating with. After a follow-up request for consent, Musk's counsel stated tersely that Elon is not supportive of this program and has declined to grant consent for it. 
Twitter offered to arrange a meeting between Musk and Lane Fox to explain the importance and utility of the proposed programs. Musk's counsel repeated that Musk didn't believe a retention program is warranted in the current environment and said Musk was unwilling to consider the advice of compensation consultants, but left open the possibility of speaking with Lane Fox. On June 28th, following further stonewalling from Musk's counsel, Twitter urged that a discussion would be fruitful. After initially suggesting Musk might be amenable to a call next week, Musk's counsel replied, Elon already gave his response, but I'll remind him of Martha's request for a call. The call never happened. Musk has continued to duck it, and neither retention program has been implemented due to defendants' unexplained and unreasonable withholding of consent. Employee attrition, meanwhile, has been on the upswing since the signing of the merger agreement. Now, remember, I've said as part of this video and as part of the prior two videos in this particular series that Twitter laying off large sections of its company looked like it would be a violation of their ordinary course requirements. Now, if Elon Musk, as they say, has the responsibility to consent to such changes as long as that consent is not unreasonably withheld, then you start to look at an issue where Elon really should be approving most of the things that they want to do. But I don't think this is the strongest of Twitter's arguments. One can look at a retention plan and say, that's not going to work. I'm not going to approve it. This is a company that I'm going to own after this is the case. And that's not necessarily an unreasonable position to hold, especially since this relates specifically to the transaction and not operating Twitter on a day-to-day -day basis. That said, I can understand why Twitter's upset about it. I'm just not sure that it rises to the level of breach. Defendants have unreasonably withheld consent in other domains as well. On June 14, Twitter sought consent to terminate Twitter's existing revolving credit facility, debt, noting that no amounts were presently drawn under the facility and that the facility would have to be terminated in connection with the merger's consummation anyway. Maintaining the facility requires Twitter to incur ongoing monthly costs. After initially saying he would consent to the termination, Musk withdrew it the next day without explanation. Okay, that's a weird one. I have to admit, Twitter. Uh, and that starts to look, especially as of June 14, that Elon Musk doesn't necessarily consider himself the owner of Twitter, uh, which is at least circumstantial evidence of what Twitter is complaining about with respect to their purported acquirer. Defendants purport to terminate the merger agreement. This, of course, happened very recently. On July 8th, Defendants Council sent a letter to Twitter purporting to terminate the merger agreement. The notice alleges three grounds for termination, purported breach of the information sharing and cooperation covenants contained in 6.4 and 6.11, supposed materially inaccurate representations incorporated by reference in the merger agreement that allegedly are reasonably likely to result in a company material adverse effect, and a purported failure to comply with the ordinary course covenant by terminating certain employees, slowing hiring, and failing to retain key personnel. These accusations are pretextual and have no merit. Pretextual, again, dirty liar. Dirty liar who lies, says this particular legal counsel. Court, remember, Elon Musk is lying about these things. Twitter has not breached its information sharing or cooperation covenants. One, Twitter has provided defendants far more information than they are entitled to under the merger agreement. Section 6.4 serves the narrow purpose of giving parent reasonable access to information necessary to close the merger. Again, is that what that says? You will furnish promptly to such representatives of Elon Musk all information concerning the business properties and personnel of the company and its subsidiaries as may reasonably be requested in writing in each case for any reasonable business purpose related to the consummation of the transactions contemplated by this merger. Have to be reasonably related, reasonable business purpose to the consummation of the transactions. Is that what's happening with these requests? Is Twitter right? Is Elon right? Hmm. It's not so narrow a purpose as Twitter likes to claim, but it is not so broad a purpose as asking for anything under the sun. So this is something that would have to be judged in a court of law. It does not give defendants a broad right to conduct post-signing due diligence of a kind they specifically foreswore pre-signing. Eh, much less does it give Musk the right to hunt for evidence supporting a bogus misrepresentation theory developed to try to torpedo the deal. Again, if he's a bad actor, all of this is right. If, however, instead he's looking for an actual set of information about how Twitter operates and how many fake bots they have, it's not so right. In any event, Twitter has bent over backwards to provide Musk the information he has requested, including most notably the full firehose data that he has been mining for weeks and has been continuing to mine since purporting to terminate with the assistance of undisclosed data reviewers. Twitter has also spent weeks and dedicated considerable resources to compiling information responsive to Musk's numerous other requests for custom reporting of user data. Musk and his representatives have received extensive data underlying Twitter's process for estimating false or spam accounts as a percentage of monetized active users, including the granular monthly reporting identifying each of the sampled accounts by user ID and the determination as to whether the account was false or spam, along with the calculation supporting Twitter's estimates going back to January 2021. 
in their termination notice, defendants list categories of information they claim Twitter has withheld. Most of this information does not exist, which we thought might be their defense when we looked at it, has already been provided or is the subject of requests only made recently in response to which Twitter has been yet again compiling responsive information when it received the termination notice. All of this information sweeps far beyond what is reasonably necessary to close the merger. Defendants also complain about rate and query limits initially accompanying the firehose data, but those limits were part of the customary commercial terms defendants initially requested. And as defense acknowledged, Twitter increased the limits immediately upon request before the purported termination. I believe they do claim it took a week. As to Twitter's cooperation obligation under Section 611, that's financing, the company has again gone well beyond what is required. The point of this provision is to assist parent in furnishing the lenders and underwriters with information to facilitate syndication of the already committed financing, of spreading out who's otherwise going to be purchasing the notes and providing money for a loan. Twitter is not obligated to provide financial information not already in existence or to provide copies of its bankers' valuation models, which are outside the company's control. Parent, not Twitter, is responsible for providing the prospects, projections, and plans for the business and operations of the company. Even so, in response to the request defendants lodged for the first time on June 17, Twitter made the extraordinary ask of its bankers to give Musk the final board deck they presented in connection with the merger. It furnished Musk with other financial information he requested. It did so even though Musk had cited no demand from any lender and no reason request related to any obligation under any relevant contract that would support these requests. There has been no breach and there would be none, even if the state of Twitter's cooperation remained the same at the end of the cure period. So they're saying they didn't get any indication that a banker or a syndicator had asked for this information. They provided it anyway. I'm not so sure that they were technically responsive to a working copy of the Goldman Sachs uh, valuation model, but they did get a board deck for him. So you have this fight about whether or not they're responsive in these kind of responses to providing data. B. Twitter's representations in its SEC filings supply no basis for termination, nor can defendants show that Twitter has made any representation or collection of representations, the inaccuracy of which is reasonably likely to result in a company material adverse effect. They do not even try. Notwithstanding that defendants have received mountains of information regarding Twitter's processes far beyond what they are entitled to under the merger agreement, their termination notice asserts only the preliminary analysis by Mr. Musk's advisors of the vast data set Twitter provided to Musk after signing causes Musk to strongly believe Twitter's reported estimates have been inaccurate. Musk's claim belief is, of course, no proof of misrepresentation, much less of a company material adverse effect, which can be established only by clearing an extraordinarily high bar that is nowhere in sight here. Twitter did not breach the ordinary course covenant. Having unreasonably withheld consent to programs designed to retain key personnel, Musk now claims that Twitter breached Section 6.1 by terminating some employees and failing to retain others who wish to leave. Like the others, the claim is meritless and contrived. While erring on the side of seeking consent, Twitter has continued to operate in the ordinary course respecting routine management decisions, including decisions concerning termination and hiring of individual employees. That's totally fine. In early May, Twitter let go of two executives and announced it would be pausing most hiring and backfills as positions became vacant. Musk's counsel was notified of those decisions at the time and raised no objection. So this is a kind of waiver argument, right? Is it the ordinary course of business for Twitter to pause hiring? Strikes me that it isn't. They inform Musk's counsel of that. They don't receive consent because that would have been mentioned here, but he didn't object. That's really not the same as consent. You have these kinds of little issues that Twitter has introduced in this document because actually pausing hiring is not the way you operate a business. So if they decided to do that, that's the kind of thing that Musk should have to consent to. This paragraph, if you're Twitter, you want to have said, we asked for consent and he withheld it, which he shouldn't have done because that's unreasonable, or he granted it, which makes everything okay. By instead saying, we told him about it and they didn't raise an objection, that's not the same when consent is required for doing things outside the ordinary course. Consistent with its hiring slowdown, Twitter announced on July 7 that it was reducing its recruiting staff, a small segment of Twitter's total employee base, by about 30%. There's a 30% layoff in a section of its operational capacity, which again, they're trying to discount here, but this looks to me very much like not operating in the ordinary course of business. If you're going to lay off a segment of your workforce at the tune of a third, that's the kind of thing that I think demands consent from the buyer. So Twitter has tried to establish that he didn't allow for retention plans, and that is a big no-no. I'm not sure I agree with that there, and then they further go on to say, sure, we paused hiring, but he didn't object. And yeah, we cut down on 30% of the staff of a particular segment of our workforce, but that's because 
of the hiring slowdown, which Musk didn't object to. Hmm? I'm not so sure that this logic follows. I'm not sure that this is a very strong argument for Twitter. These decisions aligned with Musk's own stated priorities. Days after signing on April 28th, Musk texted Twitter's board chair to say his biggest concern is headcount and expense, expense growth. So they're saying now, this is exactly what Elon Musk would have wanted to have done. In a meeting with Twitter management on May 6th, Musk again asserted that the company's headcount was high and encouraged management to consider ways to cut costs. Musk repeated these themes in conversations with Agrawal and Siegel throughout May and June. On June 16, Musk held a virtual meeting with Twitter employees. Asked what he was thinking about layoffs at Twitter, Musk responded that costs exceed the revenue, so there would have to be some rationalization of headcount and expenses. In his final conversation with Siegel before purporting to terminate, Musk expressed his concern about Twitter's expenses and asked why Twitter was not considering more aggressive cost cutting. And as noted, Musk has refused to approve or even discuss Twitter's proposed retention programs for key employees. This, I find, as long as we're using terms, entirely pretextual, right? Twitter knows it has a weakness in its argument here. Raise no objection is not a great argument. Eh, we cut down on a bunch of recruiting because we're otherwise cutting it down. And then having a paragraph that says, Musk said we are, he wanted to cut down on expenses, so this is all okay, is absolutely not a good argument, right? Because Elon Musk's expenses that he wants to call are almost certainly different from the expenses that Agrawal or the Twitter board or management wants to call. They are different individuals. There's nothing wrong with whatever one might decide, but they have different strategies. So just saying, well, he said he wanted to cut costs, so we cut costs. So it should be fine, does not answer this particular issue, which it certainly seems like Elon Musk did not consent to any of this stuff on these two pages. Twitter specifically negotiated for the right to terminate employees, including executives without first having to obtain Musk's consent. Yes, on an individual basis. You rightly described that earlier in this own document. Musk had noticed back in early May of many of the actions about which he now complains of for the first time. He did not object then or at any point prior to his purported termination notice on July 8th because there was no violation. And so now they're putting a little bit of the onus on Elon Musk saying, okay, well, so there wasn't a violation, but also intimating a kind of unclean hands, estoppel, latches argument that says, hey, you waived it. You could have objected to these things. You knew that they were happening and you didn't. And that's not the worst argument in the world, but everything else in this particular section I find to be really, really weak. Section D, having materially breached the merger agreement, defendants are contractually barred from terminating. The merger agreement provides that if defendants are in material breach of their own obligations under the merger agreement, they cannot exercise any termination right they might otherwise have, which sends us to section 8.1 D1. So we can go look at that because we got this big, long document ready to review whenever we need it. Uh, always in my file folder for the last little while. Uh, and we see here in D1, uh, by parent, if the company shall have breached or failed to perform any of its representations, warranties, covenants, or other agreements set forth in the agreement, which breach is not cured, provided, however, that parent, Elon, shall not have the right to terminate this agreement pursuant to this section if Elon is then in material breach of any of its representations, warranties, covenants, or agreements hereunder. He doesn't have the right to terminate the agreement if he is otherwise in breach. So they are going to use the rest of that document to say, Elon's in breach. As set forth above, defendants materially breach their obligation to use reasonable best efforts to complete the merger, materially breach the hell or high water covenant requiring them to do all things necessary to consummate and finalize the financing, materially breach their obligation to provide Twitter with information regarding the status of the debt financing, materially breach their obligation to refrain from unreasonably withholding consent to operational decisions, materially breach their obligations to seek Twitter consent to public comments about the deal and refrain from disparaging the company or its representatives in tweets about the merger, and materially breach their obligation not to misuse confidential information. They therefore cannot terminate the agreement, even assuming they otherwise had such right. Breach fight, which is what we said three hours ago, is that they would be having a fight about who breached what and when. And here, I think Twitter might have a point, particularly with things related to like disparaging tweets and otherwise. It's very difficult for us to tell the fact basis on things like what he did with the uh, with the financing sources, whether he didn't did or didn't provide the information they needed with respect uh, to the debt financing, those kinds of things. But what we could see in public did seem to be a potential breach. After purporting to terminate, Musk keeps violating and confirms his earlier violations. After purporting to terminate the deal, Musk continued to make public statements disparaging Twitter and confirming the pretextual nature of his post-signing conduct. 
In the early morning of July 11, Musk posted tweets implying that his data requests were never intended to make progress towards consummating the merger, but rather were part of a plan to force litigation in which Twitter's information would be publicly disclosed. Yes, if you think that these are legitimate, these are going to be the memes. Yep. They said I couldn't buy Twitter. Then they wouldn't disclose bot info. Now they want to force me to buy Twitter in court. Now they have to disclose bot info in court. Here's laughing Elon Musk and then Chuckmate, right? So they say that these statements indicate that he was never legitimate about his requests. For Musk, it would seem Twitter, the interests of its stockholders, the transaction Musk agreed to, and the court process to enforce it all constitute an elaborate joke, which honestly it could be. Musk also once again publicly called for the SEC to investigate Twitter's disclosures regarding false and spam accounts. Hello, SEC Gov. Musk's conduct simply confirms that he wants to escape the binding contract he freely signed and to damage Twitter in the process. Because of defendants' breaches and the uncertainty they have generated, Twitter faces irreparable harm. Defendants stipulated in the merger agreement that irreparable damage for which monetary damages, even if available, would not be an adequate remedy would occur in the event that the parties here too do not perform the provisions of the agreement in accordance with its specified terms or otherwise breach such provisions. The expected closing date for the merger is fast approaching. The loan remaining application for regulatory approval is under consideration and the parties have received no indication of any obstacle on that front. Twitter is prepared to schedule a stockholder vote immediately upon clearance by the SEC of its proxy statement as early as mid-August. Defendants must close no later than two business days after satisfaction of all closing conditions. Defendants' actions in derogation of the deal's consummation and Musk's repeated disparagement of Twitter and its personnel create uncertainty and delay that harm Twitter and its stockholders and deprive them of their bargain for rights. They also expose Twitter to adverse effects on its business operations, employees, and stock price. Swift remedial action in the form of specific performance and injunctive relief is warranted. Cause of action, breach of contract, specific performance, and injunction. Here is where Twitter asks for what it wants from the court. The merger agreement is valid and enforceable. Twitter has fully performed all of its obligations under the merger agreement to date. It's where one of the fights live. Defendants have breached the merger agreement by, among other things, violating these many sections. In section 9.9a, each of the parties agreed that without posting bond or other undertaking, the other party shall be entitled to an injunction, specific performance, and other equitable relief to prevent breaches of this agreement. In section 9.9b, the parties expressly acknowledged and agreed that the company shall be entitled to specific performance or other equitable remedy to enforce parent and acquisition subs' obligations to cause the equity investor to fund or to enforce equity investors' obligations to fund directly and to consummate the closing if three conditions are met. They have a duty under section 9.9b to actually buy this company if all of the conditions set forth in section 7.1 and 7.2 have or will be satisfied at the closing. That's where Twitter says that they have done everything that they need to do in order to make this thing work. You can pull that up here, right? Section 7.2, the company shall have performed or complied in all material respects with its obligations. That those are met, the debt financing has been funded or will be funded at the closing, and the company has confirmed that the closing will occur. All of the con conditions set forth in Section 7.1 and 7.2 have been satisfied or waived or expected to be at the closing, and the closing will occur if the debt and equity financing are funded, which funding is solely in control of the defendants. Twitter has suffered and will continue to suffer irreparable harm as a result of defendants' breaches. So our prayer for relief is that you order them to do this thing. Order defendants to specifically perform their obligations under the merger agreement and consummate the closing in accordance with the terms of that merger agreement. Signed by a bunch of folks. Lots of lawyers on this signature page. Page 62 of the complaint made by Twitter against Elon Musk. We made it, folks. A lot of things to be said about this document. We said most of them as we go through it. But Twitter presents a compelling narrative for an individual that was seeking to get out of a deal for which they had buyer's remorse. And they put forth that narrative uh, effectively because that is the exact kind of fact pattern that the Court of Chancery in Delaware is likely to consider when ordering specific performance of a deal. Specific performance, always a strong remedy. Courts don't like to force people to do things, but they, more than that, don't like to let bad actors somehow realize gains for their bad acts. Could Elon Musk be caught in the trap here and could Twitter force him to buy their company? I think there's a real possibility of that, although that will change depending on what we see from the response from Musk's team. Very high-powered lawyers, very high-powered law firms at play here. And certainly what we would expect to see from that response, what we would expect to see as a result of looking at all these documents, 
is an Elon Musk response that says, effectively, we asked for reasonable stuff. Nothing that they actually provided really rises to the level of breach by me and describing why it's not a breach in the way he operated. Now, I do think Elon Musk is likely to have issues there because he does play fast and loose with all these rules and the way he walks around and talks about deals online or at conferences or what have you. And I think that that might actually present a problem here. Now, is he just negotiating for a lower price? Maybe. Because you never know, whether you're Twitter or you're Elon Musk, what a judge sitting in the Delaware Court of Chancery is going to do. Twitter has presented a pretty strong case, especially on the breaches by Elon Musk that would prevent him from terminating and result in their having these rights after he tries to terminate the agreement. But Elon Musk, I would anticipate having a fairly strong response that will also be very well drafted and argued by his team. And that leaves it in the magic jukebox random number generator of a litigation setting. And with that as the background, usually what you would expect is for those two crazy kids to come together somehow to make Twitter whole with a big penalty payment or for Elon Musk to negotiate potentially a reduction in price. Clearly, Twitter doesn't love anything about this guy and was acting that way throughout the transaction. You can kind of see the defensive posture they took, even as they described the facts to their benefit in this particular document. So it really will be interesting to see where it goes. But for now, we're at the end of all things here. I'm definitely interested in taking some questions, talking to you all about this. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I don't usually just say, hey, let's go live <clears throat> and read through a 62-page document. Obviously, we do a lot of culling and a lot of shortening when we read through these things on a virtual legality proper. But I thought it would be fun this evening to just kind of walk through how I think about these things, react to them in real time, <clears throat> and have that kind of conversation with you all. So let's see. Do at Hogue Law if you have specific questions. Maybe even throw a cue in there so I can spot it a little bit better. Um, otherwise, we will uh, we will answer a few questions and then we will get out of here and leave you with the rest of your evenings. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, great stream. I always appreciate compliments. Those are always welcome here. I don't just need to highlight the co the compliments, but I really do appreciate it. Um, Julia five four three Hogla. Shout out to Secret McSquirrel for staying awake until the end to mod. Absolutely, Secret McSquirrel. I didn't have any idea that you would even be in any, any, any streams this week. Thank you so much for dropping in and hanging out with us to discuss a big, long legal complaint. Uh, that is awesome of you, and I really, really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Uh, I will give you that shout out live on video. Um, otherwise, I think everybody seems to be done. Everybody seems to be at the end here, just like I am at three years. Uh, Twitter beating Musk will not be a win, says just because much about Twitter inner workings will be exposed in court if it gets that far. Uh, there would certainly be a discovery aspect to that, uh, but we don't know whether that will in fact happen. Certainly, Twitter's not going to be too interested in that. Jason Kennedy, Hoglaw, thoughts on the definition of monetizable active users being such that there could be 50% bot counts by account numbers, but 5% bots uh, in the MDAUs and both being true? Sure. There could be a wild disconnect between account numbers and uh, monetizable account numbers, uh, I suppose. Certainly, Twitter does seem to be advocating for that, especially they have that one line that says that Firehose won't allow you to tell the difference between the M's and the non-M's. Um, and so Twitter could account for that should it come to it by saying, Elon's using the Firehose. The Firehose isn't all monetizable people. It includes even suspended accounts, potentially. Um, and so that's where you're getting this disparity. Absolutely. I can't speak to that. I'm not looking at any of this data uh, right now. But I do think it's a possibility, and I think it's a great one uh, to bring up. Uh, Adam Goals, cheers, Hogue. Thank you so much uh, for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Uh, this has been a lot of fun, a little tiring, uh, a little bit of a longer stream than I thought, but obviously reading a full document like that is always going to take some time. But I really appreciate the super chats. I really appreciate everybody's chats of having uh, these conversations. Uh, question, Hogue Law, have you worked as an auctioneer? You could. No, I just like reading. Uh, I like reading. I like presenting things dramatically. So I do love this stuff. Um, and, you know, good lawyers, big law firms, Wachtell Lipton, writing forceful documentation, I always think are fun to read through uh, like a script or a play. I'm clearly going to need to rest my voice a little bit after this stream, uh, but I have a lot of fun doing it. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Hogue. This was neat. Karen Vanderbeck. I appreciate it. I am so, so glad. Yeah. Leave comments uh, as well. Uh, you know, engage with the content, of course, for YouTube. Leave those likes uh, if you're in this stream, leave those likes. But otherwise, yeah, I never know. Uh, I don't know that I've done a, a stream like this before on this channel. I'd have to really look. 
Uh, so leave your thoughts. Um, you know, we had a couple of guests in here. We did a little of reading separate sections with those guests. Obviously, three hours is too much for most people. Um, and I think it worked pretty well. Uh, but I never know what I don't know. And I can always be learning on that. So leave your thoughts as to whether this worked, whether you like this. Obviously, I know people are going to, there's going to be a comment that says, hey, can you, can you make a shorter version of that? I understand that. Maybe I will. I'm going to rest on this for a little bit because we've gone over it so in-depthfully uh, at this point in time. But hopefully it's helpful to you. Send people here if they want a real in-depth look at this. I'll try to put some chapters in uh, to describe some of the sections. Um, otherwise, I, I think it was a lot of good fun. Uh, will Clem, Super Chat, thank you so much. What happened to the lawsuit filed by or an Orlando pension fund preventing the sales due to Delaware law? I don't know that I saw that one. Uh, certainly it would be uh, troubling for standing and jurisdiction. Generally speaking, a stockholder can't just come in and block um, a deal like this, uh, but I don't know it. Uh, so I apologize for that. It hasn't come up in virtual legality. And I don't know whether that's because I dismissed it when I read about it or whether I simply didn't read about it because I, I don't see all things on this stuff. Um, so I'll look into it uh, if you want to DM me a link or something like that. Uh, but I haven't heard about it and I doubt that it would be affected in any case. Um, Kat Hoagloss says, what do you think the reality of Twitter being replaced by anything from Musk? So I do think social media platforms in general, that networking effect gives them a lot of lock-in um, because until you get to a certain size, um, you really don't have the ability to compete with what the actual product is. Uh, so I wouldn't have a lot of faith in a brand new startup uh, acting against Twitter, except that I do think Twitter, um, there are a lot of problems with, a lot of problems with management, a lot of way, problems with the way they handle their terms of service. You can see various videos I've done in this space with issues I've had with Twitter's management decisions, the way they control data. <clears throat> the way they discuss um, uh, authoritative sources, things along those lines. Um, Joe Brums, uh, thank you for the super chat. Will you do a podcast about the January 1st commission, presumably the January 6th commission? You know, no, I don't think I will. I've left comments um, to my videos. People have asked. I know a number of my colleagues are covering them. Um, so you could check those out. Uh, regardless of what you might see from like the Supreme Court series that I sometimes do for things I think are really important, I don't try to bring politics into this space. Um, I find it to be something that people are reasonably passionate about, that is fully within their rights as human beings, and understandably so, that tends to subsume the discussion of reasonable minds can differ and understanding um, here. So for areas of those levels of sensitivity, I leave that to my betters um, that are otherwise talking about political things all the time. Hope that's okay with you. That was a determination I made a long time ago in the channel. You still will see occasionally things where I think I have a voice to add uh, and otherwise, but for things like the January 6th commission, I am leaving that to other folks. So I appreciate the super chat. I determined that a while ago. I did comment on it. I'm glad that I can have you know, uh, that message in video form. I know that's gonna be disappointing to some people, um, but I appreciate the question. Uh, Jennifer Shefford, thank you so much, Hoag. So glad I found you. Thank you, Emily, uh, Purple Heart. Well, thank you, Emily, for uh, leading you over here to the channel. I have a lot of fun on her channel last week, and I've certainly uh, had a lot of fun knowing Emily uh, and seeing her explosive growth, which could not be more well-deserved. Uh, and Emily is going to be a force on YouTube for the considerable future, uh, I would be willing to bet. Now, since my voice is completely going, I'm going to leave you all this evening here in the Eastern Time Zone. Relax. Uh, enjoy your evening, or if it's a different time of day, wherever you might be located, enjoy yourselves completely. I had a lot of fun with you all. Thank you so much for spending this much time with me, staying till the very end, and I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual.